Hello everyone, welcome to What If Ichigo Was In High School DXD Part 1, Chapter 1, Heaven to Hell. Still no word from him. Isin Kurosaki looks up from his cup of tea and at the stripped hat of Kisu Kurohara. He lets out a heavy sigh before answering the mad scientist. No it's been roughly three months since I last spoke with him. Kurohara broke open that damnable fan of his and hid half his face behind it. At this rate I don't think he'll ever come back. It's for his own good Kisuke Isin sighed again. It's best for Ichigo to move on from all this. As Isin returned his attention to his tea, he heard Urahara hum in thought. You know, the former captain of Squad 12 said slowly, I'm the very last person who should hand out advice on parenting, but it seems to me the Ichigo is well on his way to moving on on a permanent basis. Isin's grip on his cup tightened. What are you going to do if Ichigo decides to leave it all behind? Urahara said grimly. If you keep pushing him away, he may decide that he's a burden to his family and friends or even worse, that they are a burden to him. Ichigo won't do that Kisuke Isin said firmly. He's incredibly understanding and mature for his age. Yes, yes, I completely agree, Urahara said cheerily. So mature in fact that the best way to handle him is to drive him into exile and pretend he doesn't even exist. That's not true and you know it, Kisuke. Isin rumbled. Do you think me stupid? Wait, don't answer that. Urahara said quickly. I know that the only reason that you came up with this rotten plan is on the hope that Ichigo won't question your origins. So much easier to avoid the awkward I've been deceiving you all your life conversation by disposing of him like common trash. Isin looked at Urahara with a blank expression. Fuck you Kisuke, he said flatly. Um, the deceptively cheerful man said while waving his fan. And then there are his friends who think him so weak of heart that they believe he will give in to depression and petty jealousy. I mean, it's not as if he willingly gave up everything for all our sakes. The former Shinigami dropped his head onto the table. Several moments of silence passed between the two. Isin continued to wallow in his numerous regrets, while Urahara simply fanned himself. After a few moments, Isin heard a soft thud on the table and groaned as he heard a strong masculine voice. What's going on here? Ah, Yuruchi-san. The humble shop owner said good-naturedly. Kurosaki-san and I were lost on the route of life together. An awkward silence fell into the room, and Isin felt that something horribly wrong about to occur across the universe. When nothing happened, he glanced up to see a black cat staring down at him condescendingly. In other words, the cat said. You were telling this waste of space what a crap-assed father he is, right? Isin dropped his back on the table with force. Urahara laughed heartily. Nothing that intense Urichi-san. We were just reflecting on some past choices on Kurosaki-sense part. HMPH Urichi huffed. So how is my favorite strawberry doing? Oh don't ask Kurosaki-san, Urahara laughed. He hasn't spoken to his son in over three months. Oh. Don't worry though. It's all part of his master plan. Isin could actually feel Yuruchi's glare on his skull. No doubt the former assassin princess of Soul Society was seething in indignation on behalf of her student. You know, her voice came acerbically. If you don't want him, I'll gladly take him off your hands. We could even formalize an adoption and everything. The Shimin family would be ecstatic to know that Ichigo's potentially powerhouse kids would fall under their jurisdiction. You expect me to hand him over to those sharks? Isin mumbled against the wood of the table in quiet outrage. At least they would want him around, she said, the anger and resentment in her tone all too apparent. He slowly raised his head to meet her golden eyes shining with censor. It's for his own good. It's best for him to no longer be involved with our world. He can't be involved with our world. Yes, she spat. And I suppose it's also for Yuzu's and Karen's sake that they worry themselves sick for the big brother they haven't seen or heard from in months. All for their own good. Iruchi's word were like a knife twisting in his gut. He was a prideful and stubborn man, Isin knew this. However, he honestly thought that the best thing for Ichigo would be to get as far away from the machinations of soul society as possible. He knew how those old farts in Central 46 thought. Someone like his son, a wild card, would be perceived as a major threat to their power. Especially since Isin had gone and revealed himself in the conflict with Aizen. If Ichigo ended up regaining his powers and with the added knowledge of his lineage, soul society law mandated that his son take up the mantle of clan head. Never mind that the Shiba were considered outcasts now. Isin himself was ineligible due to him having abandoning his previous post. The old bastards would never let go of the opportunity to get their hands on the secrets of the Shiba family, and they would manipulate Ichigo all the way to hell and back to get them. No, it was for the best that Ichigo be driven far away. Even if it tore the boy to shreds on the inside. As for Yuzu and Karen, Isin slammed his head against the table once more. They'd understand once they were older hopefully. You know, Urahara said. Ichigo is a surprisingly resourceful and dedicated young man. What will you do if he decides to leave the country, eh? Yuroichi tilted her head. What a dumb question Kisuke. We drag him back and kick his ass. 
Screw Soul Society and their Ichigo Kurosaki is to not be approached laws. Why on earth would Ichigo leave the country Kisuke? Isan asked. Um, perhaps to start a new life away from his neglecting family. Or maybe he decides to become an internationally acclaimed model. Who knows, really. Isan looked up and stared dumbly at Urahara. Ichigo. As a model. PFFT not a snowball's chance in hell. Iruchi purred. MMM, I wouldn't mind if Ichigo went and did a catwalk in nothing but his underwear. Say what you will about that kid, but he knows how to rock his bod. Isan gagged as bile rose within his mouth. The images were only made worse by Yuruchi's all too masculine voice. There goes any thoughts of dinner tonight or sleep for that matter. The silence descended on all three as they each lost themselves to memories of the young man that had such a prolific impact on their lives in the last few years. They sat there for several more minutes before Yuruchi broke the silence. Boy, Isan. Yeah. You suck. Arako Shinji was not in a good mood. The reason being. The mountain of paperwork that laid unfinished on his desk. The damn things bred like rabbits and no matter how fast he finished them and moved on to the next pile, there would be all the more to take care of. He even locked up and sealed that bastard Azen still giving me a headache. Azen's treason, along with him leaving his lieutenant mentally unstable, left Squad 5 terribly disorganized and backtracked. Naturally, it fell to him to sort out all the problems, as he had been stupid enough to reclaim his mantle, as Captain what the hell was he thinking? Boy. Hinamori-chan. Got something here for ya, he called loudly. But no answer came, he looked up and around. Now where did his lieutenant end up? She was normally such a well-behaved girl and practically waited on him hand and foot. Getting up from his desk and maneuvering around the stacks of paper, Shinji muttered out, kids these days, I tell ya. Sliding the doors to his office open, he hollered out to the rest of his division. Any of you dunces seen Hinamori-chan? One of his subordinates cried back from somewhere. She's at the Fukutecho meeting, Captain. She is? He said to himself. Then, a female officer called out to him. Hum, that's my fifth seat, right? Shouldn't you be at your meeting, Captain Harako? She asked pointedly. He absently scratched his cheek. That was today. He mumbled. Sighing to himself, Shinji decided he better get going. Soul King knows that he doesn't need another lecture from the old man. He'd only just gotten an earful from the Captain Commander just the other day after he failed to hand in the necessary budget reports for his squad. He sighed to himself as he folded his hands within his captain's Hayori. What was I smoking when I decided to come back to this crap job? Disappearing in Whirl of Shunpo, Shinji arrived at Squad 1's barracks in a manner of minutes. Hunching over and letting out another sigh, he trudged himself over to the meeting hall. As he opened the door, he looked at the faces of all his fellow captains. Damn. You know you're late when Kenpachi arrives before you. You're late, Harako Taicho. The stern voice of the captain commander vibrates through the air. Shinji subdued a shudder as the old man stared at him with steel. He knew that look. It meant he's in for another reprimand once the meeting was over. Shinji waved him off dismissively. Sorry, sorry. Took time to dig myself out of that pile of paperwork. On that note, since when is it protocol to file a report for a backed up toilet in your squad's barracks? That earned him a few snickers as well as a few glares. Enough. Take your place. The oldest Shinigami barked. Yeah, yeah, he said as he strode over to stand opposite of the Kachiki kid. Now that was a captain who seriously had a major stick up his ass. The kid was a few centuries too young to be acting like the way he did. Don't know what went wrong with him. Yous be a lively brat that chased Yuruchi all round. As the minutes ticked on, the captains discussed various things from resources to fighting between the squads and even the occasional need to redesign the uniforms. Most of it, Shinji yawned through. Although, he threw in his two cents every now and then. An hour into the meeting, it was interrupted by the sound of loud beeping. All heads turned towards the very end of the captain's line and looked at the 12th squad captain. Kuritsuchi was a creepy fuck all around. And the worst part was that the son of a bitch knew it too. So when he reached into his robes and began to pull out something, it was with good reason the adjacent captains edged away from him. Shinji watched with minor interest as he pulled out some sort of electronic pad and began scrolling through and punching away commands. Kuritsuchi Taichu. I have warned you against using your devices during meetings before. Now put it away. Sometimes, Shinji felt bad for the old man. It must feel like taking care of children at a daycare for him. Hmm? The mad scientist hummed. Oh yes. My apologies but it appears that an interesting development has taken place. Interesting. Yukite cast from across Kuritsuchi. Yes, Squad 12's captain said while he continued to poke away at the thing. It seems Kurosaki Ichigo has gone missing. That turned a few heads. Missing? Rose said while immediately trading looks with his fellow visored. What are you saying Kuritsuchi Taicho? The captain commander demanded. As of 37 minutes ago, all traces of Kurosaki Ichigo vanished from the living world. Initial scans show that he isn't in Soul Society or Hueco Mundo either. 
The Adumbus, Shinji dropped his forehead into his hand. What have you gone and done now? So where the hell is he? Kensei growled out. Craning his neck back at an unnatural angle, Kuritsuchi tapped his chin a few times with one of his elongated nails. Well, it may be that the former substitute Shinigami is being hidden by a third party, but considering he's of no value to anyone without his powers, I doubt that. So then what is it? Shinji asked, entirely losing his laid-back demeanor and becoming deadly serious. The most logical assumption. He's been eaten by a hollow. He touched the pick to the metal strings with his right hand, while his left hand slid up and down the neck, slowly fretting away a climbing melody. It was Chad who first introduced him to the guitar and taught him how to play. He had spent hours every day practicing what his best friend had taught him and soon began to pick up different arrangements from the internet. Learning classical blues from the likes of B.B. King to the alchemical monstrosities of Jimi Hendrix, he revealed in the beautiful sounds of the world's most popular instrument. It was a shame a near whole two years went by without him picking one up. The whole sordid affair with Azen left him pursuing more aggressive troubles than leisure ones. Day in and day out, he threw himself into a hellish regime, fighting with demons both out and within. Blood, sweat and, perhaps, a few tears came down to the climax of his final showdown with the megalomaniacal genius of Sasukazen. Three years. That's how much time has lapsed since he gave up his powers. Three years since he exchanged his powers for the final defeat of Azen and the guaranteed safety of his friends of family. Three years since he sentenced himself to the bleak and meager existence of a normal human teenager. His hands quickened their movements as the momentum of the sound built and the guitar began to screech and let out a sweet sound of bitterness. He was nearly 19 now and was close to finishing to finishing his first semester of college. Having made his decision to study under as a bachelor's of business administration, he left Karakura town and moved to the dorms of Tokyo University. Though his family and friends protested him leaving to live so far away, in reality, it was something they had secretly rejoiced behind his back. He wasn't stupid, he knew that they wanted him as far away as possible from the realities of his situation. Though why on earth they felt the need to isolate him and treat him as if he were made out of glass was beyond him. If there's one thing he couldn't stand, it was being pitied. And that was exactly what they were doing. His hands began to close across the metal-plated strings and the furor of the sound picked up. The slow sorrow picked up into indignant rage as the guitar roared in reflection of its master. His fingers, swift and deadly, churned soft fretting into cold shredding. They had taken to ignoring him. Chad, Uryu, Orahim, Tatsuki they all pushed him away, fearing that he would lose himself in melancholy if he were faced with everything he had given up. Even his own family began distancing themselves from him. His father, ever the idiot, practically ignored him when he was around the house. Baron never talked to him anymore and she always ran off to Urahara's place, trying to keep her activities a secret from him. Yuzu was the same, except, instead of outright pushing him away, she would stare him distantly, as if he would fall to pieces any minutes. His sisters, despite their best efforts, were never quite capable of successfully lying to him. Idiots, the lot of them. The ferocity of the guitar died down as his fingers calmed and his movements fell back into a strong and hollow riff. He closed his eyes in a silent sigh and tilted his head, letting the soothing sounds of his emotions wash over him. The Chigo Kurosaki never felt so entirely alone in his life. Although he never held it against his friends and family as they were only doing what they thought best for him. Even if they were doing it in the most retarded way possible. His time in the Dangai, the year he spent in constant conflict with himself, left Ichigo older, wiser and, perhaps yes, more world-weary. Though he liked to consider himself the same person he had always has been. Still, Ichigo was never one to hold grudges. He had long since decided to move on with his, now all too human, life. No point trying to chase after something he never should have had in the first place. It was one of the reasons he had yet to demand answers from his father regarding his questionable human lineage. Yet, despite his acquired maturity and patience, it still hurt to know that the very people he had fought and died, twice in fact, for were pushing him to such a great distance. Such was his lot in life. As his hands came to a steady slow, he muted the hum of the music on one last powerful note, before silencing the whole surge of emotions with his palm. Opening eyes marred with a distant sadness, Ichigo let out a soft sigh before taking his guitar overhead, unplugging it and placing down on its rack. He leaned down and flipped his amp off. As he stood, he let out another sigh and ran a hand through his hair. Playing his music always left him in a sober mood. Staring up at the ceiling Ichigo let out a soft yeah. He decided that he could use a nice hot drink to go hand in hand with his mellow thoughts. Going into his bedroom, he quickly threw on a change of clothes. While Ichigo never considered himself to be one of the popular kids he always dressed fashionably whenever he went out. He put on dark grey jeans that were faded, a light beige shirt and a black leather jacket with a fur collar. As Ichigo moved to grab his keys off the dresser he caught sight of his reflection in the mirror. Instinctively, his hand moved to fiddle with a lock of his orange hair. 
He had let it grow out, and it was now shoulder length and messily fell over his eyes. With a shake of his head, he flicked his bangs away and looked deep into the reflection of his eyes. An unfathomable depth in his browner eyes as fully exhibited the burden of his now powerless soul. Walking out his apartment, he locked the door and made his way down the dorms and went out into the light of the now setting sun. A despondency washed over him as he remembered the similar colors that preceded the death of his mother. The sudden pain tore its way through Ichigo, and he clutched his chest tightly. For the last past few months, he'd been experiencing a chronic pain through his body. It wasn't serious as it only lasted a few minutes and quickly away, but lately, it had been coming up more frequently. As Ichigo resumed walking, he quickened his pace as he didn't want to linger out in the dark for too long. Knowing what he did, he had no desire to run into a hollow that he had no chance to defend himself against. Granted, he doubted he was in true danger as the paranoid bunch that the Soul Society were would leave him without supervision. No doubt, they would be keeping a keen eye on him if he ever presented even a kindling of his old power. Urahara said that it was perhaps a blessing that he lost his powers, as Central Room 46 would never have allowed him free reign after his victory over Aizen. However, despite all this, Ichigo wasn't about to walk into any form of danger as vulnerable as he was currently. Luckily, the coffee shop wasn't too from the dorms as it was built on campus to cater to the needs of the numerous college students. Within a few minutes he arrived at his destination and took a place in the line. The line was somewhat long as it was a popular destination for all the students, so he passed the time by absently tapping his foot while formulating guitar licks in his mind. The one thing that really distracted Ichigo from his lost abilities, aside from the mountain loads of homework, was his music. As the number of people in front of him dwindled, Ichigo finally arrived at the counter. Ah. Kurosaki-san. Are you getting the usual? Ichigo blinked in surprise at the man behind the cash register before smiling cordially. Yeah, that'll be all, Hanabusa-san. Anabusa was a relatively young man and owned the coffee shop and, because Ichigo always stopped by in the morning just as the shop opened, he grew familiar with him. Once Hanabusa punched in the numbers, Ichigo gave the man his debt card. Thank you for your business, the man said with smile as he swiped Ichigo's card and handed it back to him along with a receipt. Ichigo walked over to the other side of the counter and waited with a few other people for his order. After a minute or so passed, he finally picked up his cup of steaming coffee. Once he put in a hefty amount of sugar into his hot beverage, Ichigo found himself a seat. Due to the hour, most people were simply grabbing their orders and returning to their homes, so Ichigo had no trouble finding a spot to seat himself. He observed the various busy bodies as they came and went while slowly taking sips from his coffee. He looked out the window and noted that the sun had finally set and night had completely blanketed the sky. A momentary frown crossed his face as he felt something stir within him. However, he swiftly dismissed the sensation as he didn't want to go down that path. The first few months of life after the loss of his power were filled with half-hopes and dashed dreams. Every time he felt something was off or he felt strange, it was actually a desperate longing for his power to return. It was a difficult time for him, but he learned to finally let go of everything. As he continued to drink away and revel in the scalding liquid that burned its way down his throat, Ichigo's mind turned towards his younger sisters. The twins would both be at home now after a day in middle school. Karen, for all her brashness, was a puddle of goo when it came to her older brother. He knew how much she looked up to him, and, undoubtedly, his absence was weighing heavily on her mind. Poor Yuzu was probably feeling the brunt of the sister's guilt. She was never anything but gentle and compassionate. Taking a long draw from the plastic cup, Ichigo drained the entirety of its contents. However, another spasm of pain ripped its way through him, and he was forced to sit back down. With a grunt, he inhaled sharply as the pain faded and echoed away. Tensing his muscles, he made to get up again, but this time, he was stopped by a vile chill that crept up and down his spine. A feeling of cold dread made itself known in the pit of his stomach. He immediately stopped and looked around. Ichigo's eyes narrowed as he realized that he wasn't the only one to suddenly shudder. He felt a dull throb in his chest as his mind began to race. A hollow. But that's impossible I know I don't have any spiritual awareness. Despite losing his powers over three years ago, Ichigo would have instantly noticed if even an iota of his old strength returned. So what was it that had set everyone in the shop on edge? As if to answer his question, the door to the shop swung open and in strut a figure that instantaneously captured the attention of every single person in the room. He was tall, as tall as Ichigo, and had a haunting, otherworldly grace to him. But, the one thing that seized Ichigo's attention was his hair. Long flowing hair that was the same color of freshly shed blood. Ichigo stared hard at the man and grit his teeth. This man he gave the same feeling as the Mjayoku. Ethereal, fleeting and totally beyond his comprehension. Ichigo took a good look at him. The man appeared to be young, maybe a few years older than Ichigo himself, and was dressed sharply. A pinstriped black business suit with a black shirt and a scarlet tie that matched his hair perfectly. 
The red-haired man cast a glance around the shop before his blue-green gaze fell on Ichigo. The moment he spied him, the red-haired man gave an unnerving smile and began to walk towards him. As he approached, Ichigo schooled his features and swept his bangs out of his eyes. As the man sat across from him, Ichigo eyed him coolly. Hello Ichigo Kurosaki, the stranger greeted with a smile. Alarms bells rang off in Ichigo's head. The man knew who he was and, judging by the vibes he was giving off, knew what he used to be. Things were getting dangerous, and Ichigo seriously hoped that his suspicions that Soul Society was keeping tabs on him proved to be true. Can I help you? Ichigo asked with a quirked eyebrow. Straight to business then? The young man asked with a good-natured smile. Well, Ichigo Kurosaki, I regret to inform you that I'm here to collect a debt. Ichigo stared blankly at the man for a moment as he thought he heard wrong. Then, he blinked in confusion when there was no attempt on the other man's attempt to repeat himself. He's a debt collector. Dot, 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 wait a minute, I don't even have a credit card. A debt? Ichigo repeated carefully. I'm afraid so. The red haired man, while still smiling. What kind of debt? Ichigo asked. He obtained a nonchalant reply of, the big kind. Right, Ichigo drawled. Mind telling me what precisely this debt is and how in the name of hell I got it. Something he said must have set the man off as he gained a wicked crookedness to his smile. Well, it happened a few years ago. You and a group of friends trespassed on my private property, saw fit to cause wanton destruction, and then proceeded to lead my staff on a wild goose chase as you made your exit. Ichigo blinked a few times. I did. Out of curiosity, Ichigo began. Just when did I supposedly do all this? Roughly speaking, over three years ago, the man said never losing his smile. Three years. Back when he was still a substitute Shinigami. Trespassing. Property damage. Staff on a wild ghost chase. Holy crap. Ichigo garnered a look of pure shock as he stared at the well-dressed stranger. You're not the soul king are you? The man actually looked taken aback for a moment right before he burst out in wild laughter. Wrong end of the spectrum, Kurosaki-san, he exclaimed as he wiped a tear away. Though I suppose it's my fault for not properly introducing myself. As the man continued to chuckle heartily, Ichigo's eyes narrowed in irritation. You know, this has gone on long enough, he growled. Just who the hell are you? The man's laughter receded and he fixed Ichigo with a look of utmost amusement. My name is Serzich's Gremory, he said through a polite smile, and Ichigo felt a chill curl up his spine as the redhead's eyes flashed with a crimson malice. Though, nowadays, I go by Lucifer. Oh, shit. So you're the devil. Ichigo deadpanned. Yup, he responded cheerfully. And I owe you one. Aha. Uh -huh. The smile never left his face. Ichigo relaxed and threw an arm behind his chair. Don't take this the wrong way or anything, Ichigo said casually. But you're pretty feminine looking for supposedly being the embodiment of evil. Lucifer blushed, blushed. Yeah, I get that a lot, he said while rubbing the back of his sheepishly. I took after my mom more than my dad. Ichigo looked at him in surprise. You have parents. Of course I do. The amusement on his face was a little unnerving. What? Did you think I popped out of the ground or something? Ha! Huh, Ichigo tilted his head and brushed his hair from his eyes. I always thought you were some sort of angel turned demon thing. Ah, common misconception, Lucifer said good naturedly. That would be my predecessor. After he died, I took over the job. Ichigo had been through a lot of strange things in his life. Very strange. Suffice it to say, this conversation was quickly making its way to the number one spot. The devil died. Ichigo said incredulously. Yeah, Lucifer shrugged. There was a war, a really big one, and he and his cohorts went down along with several other major players. Through a series of long and painful events, I ended up with a job. Ichigo could only offer something as simple as, oh. As he processed the information, Lucifer snapped his fingers and a glass filled with a dark purple liquid appeared. He lifted the glass and took a light slip. Ichigo always wondered if there was more than soul society out there, but this this was entirely beyond him. The devil. The most feared and reviled figure across numerous cultures and religions was calmly sipping away in front of him with a smile plastered on his face that was all too reminiscent of a certain eccentric candy shop owner. So, Ichigo stated carefully. What precisely do you want from me? Um, Lucifer tapped his chin. Well, for starters, could you tell me why you felt the need to bust into my domain and cause so much trouble for me? Ichigo blinked in surprise before he said, sure. And tell him he did. Ichigo explained everything and how it went down to Lucifer. From his initial skirmishes with the escaped sinners to being duped by that crazy son of a bitch who kidnapped Yuzu, him losing control and going berserk, to finally beating the crap out of Kakuto. By the end of his tale, Lucifer had his face hidden in shadows and Ichigo couldn't make out his expression. What he could tell was that the man's air beings. Shoulders were trembling and shaking. The next thing he knew, his hand was being held in a firm grip and the devil decided to get up close and personal. 
Big watery eyes filled with unshed tears and lower lip quivering violently, the king of hell began to cry in front of a now completely terrified Ichigo. Kurosaki-san. The red-haired devil cried. To think you would go so far and suffer so greatly for your Amado. You are a great no. You are a true paragon for big brothers across all of creation. Consider any debt between us absolved. Hey now, Ichigo cast a wary glance across the shop as he attempted to shake the redhead's grip off. You're causing a scene. Indeed, the entire store was now looking at the two young men in interest. A few of the more imaginative females saw two handsome young men, one of which who was crying, holding hands together. Several noses started to drip red. Lucifer conjured a handkerchief from thin air and blew his nose rather unmannerly. Sorry, it's just that I have a little sister of my own, and I'm always fretting over her. She's such a free-spirited child, so a big brother can't help but worry. I see. Ichigo did not see. It was hard enough trying to come to terms that the devil wasn't all that he was cracked up to be, but he was also a worrying older brother. Things couldn't get more bizarre. Nodding his head, Lucifer wiped away his tears. My Rhea Tan is going through her rebellious phase so it's been particularly hard on me these last few years. Aria Tan. The devil gained a wide smile, normally said fact would fill most people with a horrid dread, but at this point, Ichigo just wanted to be rid of him. My sister, Rhea's. Wanna see a picture? He asked excitedly and began to dig through his pockets. Ichigo expected something along the lines of a small photo in his wallet, so when the redhead pulled out an entire album seemingly out of nowhere, Ichigo felt exasperation dig into his skull. Somewhere in his mind, an amused part of realized that a few years back he would have snapped at the man for wasting his time and probably done something rash. Look. Lucifer pointed excitedly. This is Rhea's when she had her first dance recital at age 5. And this one was from when she first learned to use magic. Oh. And this one was just last year. Her first year entering high school. Ichigo watched with no small sense of amused confusion as Lucifer pointed to picture after picture. Ichigo's own eyes softened considerably and he gained a faint smile. It obvious to him that this individual loved his sister. The shine in his eyes, the warmth in his facial expressions and the way his smile spilled infectious joy were not lost to Ichigo. So even the devil has a heart he silently mused. Lucifer saw. No no, Lucifer said flippantly. Call me Serzichs. I only use my title for official business. Okay, Ichigo gave a small chuckle and prompted his elbows on the table, then folded his hands in front of his face. You said your sister just entered high school last year. Are you saying she's only a teenager? Yup. Serzichs smiled brightly. She recently turned 17 a few months ago. Ichigo blinked in surprise. She's even younger than me. He muttered. Devils have a very low birth rate. A couple will most likely have two or three children over the span of several centuries. Yes, devils, Serzichs said and continued at Ichigo's look of confusion. There's a separate part of hell known as the underworld. It's split between us devils and fallen angels. Angels? Ichigo's eyebrows disappeared into his hairline. There are many factions of the supernatural, Ichigo-kun. Serzichs explained. And each faction has its own afterlife. I had no idea. Ichigo admitted. Most humans don't. Japan is ruled by the Shinto faction. Their afterlife is governed by the Soul King of Soul Society. And, for one reason or another, the Soul King keeps his subordinates ignorant of the rest of the world. But he is very serious about maintaining the regulation of souls, so there's never been a major issue. That that's a lot to take in at once, Ichigo said as every word of Serzich's caused his eyes to grow. Serzich's nodded sympathetically. The world is much bigger than you think, Ichigo-kun. Taking it all in, a question suddenly popped into Ichigo's mind. Wait, if each place has its own afterlife, how come you're in charge of Japan's hell? Ah, well you see, Serzichs explained, hell is the agreed universal dump for all the world's sinners. And, as luck would have, I got stuck with the job of running the place. Oh you said Shinto faction. He prompted for more. Yes, the Shinto hierarchy is headed by Amaterasu. The Soul King runs their afterlife under her direct orders, but for the most part, Soul Society is autonomous. Ichigo leaned back in his seat, the overload of information beginning to take its toll. Wow, Ichigo breathed, eyes widening. All those fairy tales are true. For the most part, yes. Huh, Ichigo said before letting the air between them fall into a comfortable silence. What a revelation. He spent over a year fighting for what he thought was for the fate of the world, when in reality, the world didn't need him at all. Actually, it might have been worth it to let Aizen do whatever the hell he pleased only to watch as he got his ass handed to him by higher powers. Am I trained and got stronger so I could protect them all to protect them from Aizen when, in reality, neither of us knew just how low we were on the ladder. Well Ichigo Kun Serzichs said, breaking Ichigo away from his thoughts. I'd say our business is concluded, but I wanted to extend an offer to you. His attention fully returning to the legendary being of evil before him, Ichigo quirked an eyebrow at him. An offer? He repeated. 
How would you like to work for me? Serzicha said with a dangerous smile. Work for you, Ichigo said in surprise. What could a useless human like me do for you? Useless? Serzicha's mirrored Ichigo's look of puzzlement. I can assure you, Ichigo-kun, you are far from useless. And as for human, well, I could make you into a devil. That's exactly when Ichigo knew to back out. Sorry Serzicha-san, but I don't plan on giving up my humanity for anything. Now Ichigo could staunchly believe that this man was the devil of legend. Serzicha's eyes flashed and gained a predatory glint. I can give you anything you want you know. Sorry Serzicha-san, but I have to refuse your kind offer. Yeah, Ichigo was actually being tempted by the Prince of Hell himself. Screw every hollow in existence. This was infinitely more terrifying and, strangely enough, exhilarating. Not even for riches. Serzich is tempted. For all the women in the world. A chance to cure your illness. A chance to conquer a nation or to even become immortal. Ichigo shook his head. No, no and wait a minute what? What do you mean illness? Serzich is smirked at him. Give me some credit, Ichigo-kun. Do you honestly believe that I, the ruler of the underworld, wouldn't notice your sickness when the source of it is my own realm? Ichigo looked flabbergasted. What are you talking about? Smirk faltering, Serzich's said, you you don't know. Know what Ichigo nearly yelled. Serzich's looked absolutely horrified and Ichigo knew right away that when the devil makes that kind of expression, shit's about to hit the proverbial fan. Ichigo kun you're dying. He whispered. His words took some time to sink in, but Ichigo heard them loud and clear. He would have denied the assumption. He would have raged at the absurdity. But deep down, through that intuition which developed in countless life and death moments, Ichigo knew that Serzich's words rang true. The random spasms of pain made all too clear to him. Eyes horrifically wide, fingers numb with cold reality, Ichigo's hand trembled as he slowly brought it over his chest. He felt the dull beat against his ribs and wondered how long he'd been dying without him even realizing it. He asked the only question that he could think of. How? His voice barely above a whisper. Serzich's eyes had a shadow creep over them, and Ichigo recognized that despite his almost childlike demeanor, this man was old. When you entered hell, Serzich's began softly. You were given power by the Kushinata. You accepted the energies of hell into your soul. The kind that leave a permanent mark and don't go away. That long ha. Huh? Ichigo thought wistfully. While you remained a Shinigami, your powers contained the dormant particles of hell. However, the moment you returned to being human. I never stood a chance, Ichigo finished for him. Serzich's nodded sadly. How long do I have left? Ichigo asked solemnly. Serzich's shrugged. I can't be sure, but I'd say anywhere from a year to three. And the chance of a cure? Ichigo asked but not getting his hopes up. His eyes slowly dimming and a dark mirth settling in at the irony of his situation. Killed by sickness of all things. Early on, perhaps, it could have been possible to quarantine hell's power within a small portion of your soul or even purify it, but now, it spread too far. For all intents and purposes, hell has claimed your soul. You said that you could cure me, Ichigo suddenly asked sharply. Serzich's gave him a piercing look. Are you sure? You seem pretty adamant about remaining human. Carefully, going over his words in his mind before speaking them, Ichigo said, what would change if I became a devil? Your physical capabilities would be greatly enhanced. Serzich is hummed. You'd gain the capacity to learn magic. Certain humans have also exhibited an increase in comprehensive capabilities. Your lifespan will increase to a devil's natural one. That doesn't sound all that bad. Ichigo said in wonder. Admittedly, anything even remotely holy would bring about a great deal of pain by association or touch. If you plan on getting married in a church then please throw those plans away. Hmm, Serzich is hummed to himself. Ah yes, angels and fallen will generally attack you on sight. And every reincarnated devil has experienced an increased desire to ah, uh, well sin. Will I be able to see my family again? Ichigo asked quickly. Of course, Serzich has said. On your days off that is. Ichigo's brow furrowed in confusion. Days off. As I said, you'll be working for me. Think of me as your employer. Oh. Serzich's tapped the table with a single finger, and a chessboard appeared. Ichigo looked down in curiosity as he noted that one side of the board was empty of any pieces, while the other side had a full set that glowed an ominous red. Then he noted that the pawn piece all the way at the right end of the board was pure black and looked like a twisted spire of metal. These are what are known as evil pieces. Serzich's smirked. Evil pieces? Ichigo asked. It's how devils reincarnate other species. Serzich's explained. After the Great War, where the original Satans died, our numbers were severely lacking and our race on the verge of extinction. You're not the only one. Patience, we'll get there soon enough. Serzich's said, holding up his hand. Now, one of my fellow Satans came up with this method. The king refers to the leader of the peerage. That would be me, by the way. Now each piece has a unique characteristics. Ichigo nodded. Serzich's placed a finger on a piece. 
A knight will be gifted with the ability to move at extreme speeds and is generally very agile. Past and agile pretty much Uruchi. Moving his finger, he touched another piece. The bishop is granted an augment towards his magical abilities and arcane arts. Thus I or even Hachi Ichigo equated in his mind. The rook, he gestured to the end piece in the last row. Is a powerhouse. Capable of taking and dishing out extreme punishment. Pinpachi. The queen is the second most powerful Serzichas said and usually in charge of the peerage during the king's absence. The queen has all the benefits of the other three pieces, though to a lesser degree. Sums up by Akuya who's well-rounded on a master level. And finally, we have the pawns. He said while gesturing over the vanguard. The most versatile of the pieces. With the king's permission, a pawn can promote and take on the characteristics of any of the other pieces. Ichigo soaked up all the information like a sponge. So by the fact that only one pawn isn't red, I'm gonna guess you have 14 other servants. Actually, Serzich is smirked. I only have a total of 7 servants. You're going to make number 8. I don't follow. Ichigo stated, his brow furrowed. Depending on the strength of the potential servant, Serzich has specified, they may take up more than one piece. My knight and bishop used up both their respective pieces. And I only have two pawns that used up my other seven. Ichigo's mouth twisted on a sour note. So I'm only worth one pawn then. This, little beauty, he said holding up the untaken pawn, is what is known as a mutation piece. It's an extremely rare piece that is more valuable than any other. They are generally reserved for extremely powerful pieces. Luckily, they're easy enough to get when your best friend from your childhood invented them. You're going to waste it on me? Ichigo asked incredulously. I'm starting to think you have insecurity issues, Ichigo-kun. Serzich has chuckled quietly. Trust me. You're far from worthless. Ichigo rubbed the back of his head awkwardly. He never was comfortable with praise. As I've said, Serzich has continued. You have hell itself flowing through your soul currently. To me, that screams potential. Not to mention you may even regain your previous powers maybe not your Shinigami ones but, Serzich's lips curved in a, dare he say it, devilish smirk. You may just regain your hollow ones. That certainly brightened Ichigo's day considerably. His powers ever since he lost them he'd been feeling as if a section of his very being was missing. Now, Serzich has said folding his hands in front of him. Before you jump and make a decision, why don't I let you know just what you're getting into? So, for the next hour, Ichigo listened as Serzich's gave him a crash course on how things were run down, he assumed down, in the underworld. The nobility and the 72 pillars, the different tiers of devil rankings and the rating games. He even told Ichigo what would be expected of him as member of a Satan's peerage. The pressure and scrutiny that would be heaved on him. The duties he would have to perform and what level he would have to perform them. And most importantly, the level of power and strength he would have to maintain and show at all time. Oh, Serzich has said. I forgot to mention one last thing. Ichigo gave him a questioning look. Due to your unique situation and affinity to hell, I may ask you to manage the sinners and even track down a few escapees every so often. Does it happen often? Ichigo asked, his own foul experience with the situation. Every now and then, we get some sort of idiot necromancer trying to dig too deep. I normally assign the cleanup job to whoever's territory is closest, but we'll make it part of your official duties. Lucky me, Ichigo said dryly. Oh don't be like that, Serzich has smiled. We can even give you a cool epithet. Hmm how about the overseer of hell? Or the hunter of the damned? Oh. I know. The sinful strawberry. That last one sounds like a porno, Ichigo said flatly. Huh, Serzich has adopted a thoughtful countenance. It does doesn't it? After a few seconds, they both doubled over in wild laughter. Several moments later they both straightened and Ichigo locked eyes with Serzich's who rested his cheek against his fist. So how about it, Ichigo-kun? What do you say? Serzich's reached down with his other hand and picked up the black piece and slightly held it out to Ichigo. Would you join the Serzich's Lucifer? Ichigo stared hard at the glistening piece of metal in Serzich's hand. On one hand, he would be giving up his humanity and possibly leaving everything behind for good. On the other hand, said life was drastically cut short and Serzich's was offering him life as well his powers back. Ichigo laughed suddenly as he blew bangs from out his face. It's so cliche. I'm actually making a deal with the devil. Just wait until we get to the dancing. The devil said with a smirk and it wasn't lost on Ichigo on how Serzich's eyes began to redden. Ichigo reached out and just as his fingers were about to touch the twisted metal, he pulled back and averted his gaze from Serzich's. The devil didn't say anything, and Ichigo was left to stew in his thoughts. The cold dread of rejection if any of his family or friends found out nodded him painfully. He closed his eyes, a crushing darkness falling on his soul. The ultimate irony as one already existed within and was slowly eating away at him. Is it wrong? Ichigo whispered uncertainly. To want to live. The lover of life is not a sinner, Ichigo, Serzich said smoothly. Taking a deep breath, Ichigo recalled his very first lesson as a Shinigami. 
Why do you run, Ichigo? You still have not called on me. Face forward, Ichigo. You should be able to hear it now. That which blocks your ears is worthless fear. The enemy is one you are one. What is there to fear? Cast off your fear. Look ahead. Move forward. Never stand still. Retreat, and you will age. Hesitate, and you will die. Shout. My name is. Ichigo reached out with the faintest of smiles, his resolve unwavering, and he let out a soft whisper, Kurosaki Ichigo. There was a flash of brilliant crimson. How's he doing? He said as he approached the bed. Serzich's watched on as his wife wiped his newest pawn's brow with a wet towel. Rafia did not look up and continued looking after the boy. The change is gradual, but it is happening. He caught a glimpse of her face and saw that her lips turned in a frown. He didn't say anything and walked over to a large window. He leaned his back against the glass and craned his neck to look at the two moons in the underworld sky. After a moment, his wife called out to him. Serzich's. Um, he intoned as he looked over at her. She was looking at him while gently brushing the youth's hair back. Lucky brat Serzich as though with a twinge of amusement. Looks like Grafia found another kid to fuss over and she hasn't even properly met him yet. Why hasn't he changed yet? The transformation should have been immediate. Serzich has put on a thoughtful look before returning to look at the moons. Tell me Grafia, do you know the difference between a warrior and a soldier? Huh? Obviously she was startled by the abrupt change in subject. Ichigo Kun is a soldier. He fights to protect. Devils by nature are a warrior race. We fight to conquer. He looked back at his wife and gave her smile. Right now, he is in a desperate battle in his very soul. Trying to find the path he needs to walk. Did you know this would be happening? She asked sternly. Not in the least, he laughed. Imagine my surprise when he slumps forward in front of me in the middle of a coffee shop. Half the humans were looking at me as if it were my fault. Technically speaking, it was your fault, Lord Serzich as she fixed him with a glare. And what have I told you about making a scene in public? Hey, hey, Serzich said. I don't want my maid. I want to speak to my wife. You will get the chance to speak with her when she decides that you've grown up. But Grafia, he said, reverting to a childlike demeanor. I love you so much. Why would you reciprocate my love? Serzich's Sama, Grafia glowered as she gained a tick mark. Faster than she could see, Serzich's appeared behind her and wrapped his arms around her waist. It's not fair how tender you were being with Ichigo kun, and how cold you're now being why off. Grafia cut off his childish rant by slamming her elbow into her master's gut. Behave yourself, Lord Serzich's. There is a child in the room with us. Serzich's snorts and, regardless of his wife's warning, entwined his arms around her once more. He's no more of a child than we are, Serzich's said, while he let a hint of sadness creep into his voice. He smiled slightly when he was rewarded with his wife leaning into him gingerly. He will make a good addition to the family. The very best. Ichigo Kun is the type to rewrite fate if it means protecting his loved ones. Grafia gave a hum of approval in his arms. And you know what else? I don't think Ichigo is trying to find a path right now. Shifting his gaze towards his newest pawn, Serzich has allowed the faintest of smiles to drift to his lips. No, he's more the type to forge one. Chapter 2. And live for every breath. Ichigo's eyes drifted open and he was greeted with an all too familiar sight. Familiar and sorely missed. The skyscrapers were the same as ever. The deafening silence still roamed through the horizon, and the sense of tranquility was already imbued within the air. Although, he noticed there was one startling change from when he was last here. The sky was no longer a vibrant blue. Rather, it was a stark red laced with black clouds. As he noted the amorphous black's masses pass by, Ichigo noticed something on the edge of his vision. An ethereal crimson glow surrounded one of the skyscrapers in his mindscape. Ichigo walked over to the edge of the building he was standing on. His hands tucked away in his jeans, he stared dispassionately down at the building. It was then that he realized, upon getting a better look at it, that it wasn't one of the gargantuan buildings in his soul. Instead, it was the twisted spire of iron that shaped the chess piece that Ichigo had grabbed from Serzich's. It was the pawn piece, the one Serzich's had called a mutation piece. Quite the eyesore, ain't it? Ichigo twisted his waist and cast a glance over his shoulder. White robes lined with black fur, bone white hair falling to the back of his knees, and a skull-like mask with curved horns and tribal markings. A pale imitation of Tensa's Anjetsu in his left hand. Exactly the same as he was three years ago. Was wondering when you'd show up, Ichigo said with a nostalgic quirk of the lips. Alabaster fingers rose to the chin of the mask and tilted it back. The all-too-familiar wolfish grin and flash of teeth were, strangely enough, comforting to Ichigo. He turned back around to observe the changes to his soul. Hey don't go ignoring me now. This is our long-awaited reunion. Ichigo's lips quirked as he could hear the scowl in his hollow's voice. The damn thing hadn't changed one bit. Which was a bit disconcerting as Ichigo felt that a reflection of his soul should have matured along with him. Unless he really hadn't changed in the last three years. Where's the old man? Ichigo asked unconcernedly. 
Ha! Ah, his hollow exclaimed. Seriously? That's the first thing you're gonna ask me it's barely been a minute and you're already pissing me off. Ichigo turned around and rolled his eyes. Perhaps he did grow up and just shoved all his immaturity to his hollow. Well, Ichigo sighed. Might as well do this. The hollow blinked a few times, the hell you talking about. Ichigo closed his eyes and held out his hand. His inner world responded. Behind Ichigo, the massive representation of Serzich's hold on his soul gave off an even stronger light. The wind picked up in the mindscape and the dark clouds drew themselves forward and spiraled towards Ichigo's outstretched hand. In a rush, the black vapor began to condense itself in his hand. Ichigo opened his eyes and beheld a single black double-edged sword. He examined it closely as the metallic sheen reflected light. Ichigo cast his gaze back towards the sky. Without the clouds, a mercurial moon hung onto the crimson sky. Holy shit that's creepy as fuck he heard his hollow exclaim. Though Ichigo would normally agree with the sentiment, he actually thought that it was quite appropriate. The silver moon was a perfect reflection of the hollow mask he donned in his fight with Aizen. After staring for a few seconds, Ichigo went back to examining his new blade. It was wider than Tensa's and Jetsu by more than inch and perhaps longer by half a foot. It was also quite heavier. The most startling difference, though, was the lack of a guard. It only consisted of a hilt wrapped in black cloth. Ichigo twirled the new blade in his hands and gave a few experimental swings. Ichigo smirked. Drawing from the depths of the blade, as he would have done if Zanjetsu were still in his possession, a dark wellspring of power answered and surrounded him in an aura of pure malevolence. His brown eyes glimmered a deep red and Ichigo flashed out of existence. The hollow barely had time to react as Ichigo's black steel crashed into Tensa Zanjetsu. Power flared from both of them as the weight of Ichigo's attack crushed the ground beneath them. The hollow surprise was momentary and, quick enough, a maddening grin spread across his face. Crimson Riatsu exploded and the hollow pushed back against Ichigo. The sheer friction and collision of their aura caused flames to randomly flicker about them, sparks fly and tendrils of electricity to flare. Ahahaha. It laughed maniacally. Oh you definitely changed for the better. Show me more. The corners of Ichigo's lips curved in answer as his darkened blade bled power. Jitsuga. The hollow's golden ur eyes as widened. Oh fuck yo. Tenshin. Serzich has noted with amusement that Ichigo's body began to leak demonic power and a translucent veil of red light blanketed his newest palm. Grafia threw him a concerned glance, but he simply dismissed her worries with a smile. He raised a hand and a small green glow covered the tip of his index finger. He drew a small magic circle in the air and nodded contently. There, he said. That should keep any residue from damaging his body by accident. Grafia bit her lower lip. This is quite unusual. He's quite the unusual young man, Serzich has chuckled. But that's where his strength lays, I think. I do believe that unconventionality is the norm for him. Husband and wife stood in silence as they observed Ichigo transition between the realms of life and death. Serzich stole a glance at his beloved and suppressed a quirk of his lips as he witnessed the obvious maternal distress in her eyes. Mothers will forever fret over children in distress. Whether they be their own or not. Oh yes. Ichigo Kurosaki would make a wonderful addition to his family. Rafia. He continued when she turned towards him. Would you be a dear and continue to watch over Ichigo-kun? I have to pay Sir Afal a visit. Infusion briefly flitted across her eyes, but she quickly nodded her head. Thanks. He bent down and brushed his lips against hers. I'll be back in a couple of hours, he murmured. He caught one last gaze of Ichigo breathing evenly on the bed before sinking into a magic circle. Soon the young man would awaken and need his help in adjusting into his new existence. Today was turning out to be a very good day. Now all that was left to do was get Serafal to help him come up with a viable excuse to explain to Amaterasu why he just stole her favorite human. Even as his clothes were torn and ruined, as his body stood marred by bleeding wounds and his bones crept with exhaustion, Ichigo couldn't help but feel a sense of rightness over the entire situation. Too long he lamented. The screaming of steel. The tang of blood. The flow of death. Exhilarating. There was no better feeling for life when on the line towing death. That sheer rush's power gripped his heart and set it beating in thunder. The numbing of his mind, the need to strive. It was survival made manifest. The will to live. He missed it. It was that part which had become so incumbent to his lifestyle. That peace which he was forced to give up for the sake of that which he treasured. It was his again. He had it back. Instinct. Tensa's Anjetsu was a blur as it barely missed carving out his throat. The hollow cackled even as its white robes were stained with blood. Both its own as well as Ichigo's. Ichigo was forced to duck and weave as a wild barrage of stabs were aimed at his head. He twisted on his foot, barely avoiding the point of the white sword piercing his eye. The hollow quickly changed its own footing, and the stab became a swing that threatened to decapitate him. Black steel screeched against Stanch White as he brought up his arm. They quickly changed their stance and gripped their respective weapons with both hands, pushing against one another in a lock of blades. 
sweat and blood kicked the grips of each sword, even as their masters poured more and more power against one another. Leaning his mass into the struggle, a distant memory surfaced to the front of Ichigo's mind. He loosened one hand from his sword even as he subtly began to lose ground and pointed one finger into the hollow's bewildered face. Siro. Mauau. You can't be doing these kinds of things Serzich's Chan. The bubbly little leviathan glowered at him from behind her desk. A desk which, he noted with envy, lacked any paperwork. Of course, the numerous secretaries and interns running around behind him were probably to thank for that. He sighed internally. Shane Grafia would never let him get away with something like that. I've already explained it to you Sarah. He was already claimed by hell. Is it really such a big deal I went one step further? It is. Sarah Fall childishly pummeled her desk with her small fists. Why? He asked with a tired sigh. She gave him a pout and said, it gives me more documents that I need to sign, that's why. Sarah, he said exasperatedly. Fine, fine, she snapped as she stood up from her chair. Everyone. All of the numerous staff of the Foreign Affairs Department stopped their mad rush to deal with Serafal's responsibilities and looked at their leader. Out, out. There was loud stamping as all the devils who were employed by Serafal's part of government quickly vacated her office. As soon as the office doors shut with a click, the childlike Satan fixed him with a glare and huffed as she sat down. Her form shimmered and where once the infamous magical girl Levia Tan sat was now a tall woman of haunting beauty and long silken strands of raven black hair that fell to the back of her knees. Serzich's raised an eyebrow as he saw that all his old friend was wearing was a racy black gown of sheer lace and silk. I really hate taking this form. Her voice no longer girlish and instead husky and throaty. It's so uncute. Her perfect nose wrinkled in distaste. Serzich's emeralds locked with Seraphol's shadowed azure. It was a political shitstorm when your boy went on a rampage in hell, Serzich's, she said, getting to the topic at hand. The elders were all clambering for us to take an overtly aggressive stance. Serzich's grimaced. He remembered all too well the calamity from three years ago, considering he was the one who had to clean it all up. It was only made worse when the Shinto faction claimed that they held no responsibility for the kid's actions as he was, all too woman. Even worse was Amaterasu claiming that he was under her divine protection and that no action could be taken against him. I've already dealt with the elder Sarah, Serzich has dropped his chin onto folded hands. They haven't any right nor authority to complain. Hell is solely my domain. I've made that abundantly clear. I know that Serzich's Serafal closed her eyes in a silent sigh. But you blatantly took a human who had the expressed interest of Takamagahara. Not only that but you've dumped him right into the middle of the elder's playing field. She gave him a worried look. Do you honestly think that those stubborn fossils will let things go? They will be after the boy regardless of your protection. Serzich's smirked as he leaned back into his chair. They can try but they're going to be in for a rude awakening when they do. Serafal raised a delicate eyebrow. All they see is a reincarnated human, Serah what they deem trash. What they don't see is a devil with a deeper connection to hell than they can ever dream of. Serafal let a sad smile grace her lips. If you say so, old friend. Just be careful okay? We can't afford any distractions. He returned her smile full on. So you'll take care of Amaterasu for me? Yes I'll deal with her you lovable oaf, her smile turning into exasperated fondness. Just know you owe big time. I'll have Enku take some photos of Sona when he goes to visit Rias in the human world next time, Serzichas said as he stood up. You do that, Serafal chuckled. As he prepared a circle to teleport away, Serafal called out to him, and something in her voice caused him to falter in his magic. Serah? He asked with a frown. I've been debating whether to tell you this or not but, she bit her lower lip, and her gaze was centered on the ground. The vanishing dragon has revealed itself, and there have been multiple sightings all over the world. I see, Serzich said hesitantly. Most avoided the heavenly two like a plague. Nobody wanted to get caught between the berserker battles between each new incarnations. Admittedly it had been roughly a full century since the last clash between the legendary dragons. I doubt any of our people will be foolish enough to involve themselves with their rampages. Serzich's the anxiety in her eyes was all too clear. Most of the sightings have been centered in Japan. His eyes went wide as an icy grip clawed his heart. Wherever one was, the other was sure to follow. If the Welsh Emperor and the Vanishing Emperor took their battle to Japan. The girls. I'm sure they'll be fine, Serzich's said after a moment and swallowing hard. For all we know, the red one hasn't even been born yet. Serafal sagged. I oh so hope so. Black and white eradicated buildings and tore through the sky in a bloodstained hurricane, while the rest of the inner world trembled under the duress of the battle. Every clash of steel sent shockwaves through the world and caused entire skyscrapers to splinter. Soul-shattering cries echoed throughout the scape. Ichigo heaved his torn body as his blood throbbed and ached in his temples. They never stopped, constantly moving at supersonic speeds. The hollow had all of his mask disintegrated and sported a bloody gash across his forehead. 
Ichigo's, meanwhile, had his arm limply at his side, dripping blood all over the ruined structures. His foot hit the ground, and immediately he whirled away in a burst of speed, a single step carrying farther than humanly possible. The hollow two dashed forward, meeting him halfway. Ichigo swung down with all the force he could muster, while the hollow cut in a wide arc. The two blades met, unleashing a torrent of demonic and spiritual power. The aftershock of each encounter had laid waste to the scenery that the old man was once tired of. All that remained was the jagged piece of twisted metal that represented the devil's hold on his soul. The mutation piece and the macabre moon that looked down at the two combatants. Back and forth, their weapons met, their souls rang in discorded harmony. A look of grim satisfaction etched into both pair of eyes. The hollow stepped forward, bringing Tensa's and Jetsu down with both hands. Ichigo immediately sidestepped and lashed out with a kick that connected to the hollow side, causing it to stumble slightly. Taking advantage, he pressed on and attempted to run his hollow through however, the white monster quickly jumped back and smacked Ichigo's blade away with its own. Again, their blades met and the ground beneath was torn asunder. It was then that fate struck and the hollow lost its footing. Ichigo rushed and, with preternatural reflexes ducked beneath the lethal white blade. As Ichigo passed the hollow, golden her eyes as widened in shock. Reversing his grip on the demonic sword, Ichigo roared as he plunged the blade backwards. There was a cry of shock as metal severed sinew and crushed through bone. A moment passed between the two as they stood with their backs to each other. Features twisting fear alike, Ichigo's grip on his blade tightened, and he savagely tore the blade out of the hollow's back. He stood there, underneath a red sky and silver moon, his breathing strenuous and his shoulders completely slouched. His gaze flittered across the horizon. Devastation and ruin lay as far as the eye can see yet, he couldn't bring himself to care. For the first time, in a very long time, Ichigo felt entirely and wholly free. Exhaling loudly, Ichigo turned around to see the hollow spread eagle on the crumbling ground. A crimson blanket pooling beneath it. As both labored in their breathing, gold and ruby locked gazes. Even as their swords had contested their wills, their eyes voiced their souls and, what seemed to be an eternity passed, between the two. Zanjetsu Ichigo breathed out, his brow furrowing. The hollow laughed, only to fall into a coughing fit. Erg figured it out did ya? Took you damn well long anu herk. Blood sprayed from its mouth. Where is he? Ichigo asked, mere casual. Zanjetsu rolled his head on the floor, and Ichigo followed his line of sight to the colossal mutation pawn piece. He was different. Wasn't Shinigami nor was he hollow don't know where he went maybe cause you ain't human anymore. Ichigo let the word sink and realization floored him. Are you saying he was? Zanjetsu chuckled, only to be rewarded for his effort with more coughing. How is that possible? Ichigo mainly said to himself. Hell if I know but I'll tell you this the old man it'd be ridiculously happy if he were here now. Because I kicked your ass. Zanjetsu scowled. No, you jackass. What was the last thing we said to you before we taught you the final Jitsuga tension? What I want to protect is you Ichigo. Your dumbass finally got it you finally starting to fight for yourself Zanjetsu had a massive grin on his face even as his body began to disintegrate. Try not to get yourself killed now, you hear. Yeah, Ichigo said, a small smile on his face. I get you. HMPH, and Zanjetsu faded away. Ichigo stood still as the remnants of his Zanpakutam swirled about him, before slowly settling onto and merging with his new sword. There was a flash of white light, and Ichigo let blissful oblivion take him. Looks like he's finally starting to come out it, Surzich has noted as Ichigo's power ceased to flare and began to settle down. With a wave of his hand, he undid the seal he placed on the young man's body, and, almost immediately, Grafia was by his side. Surzich has chuckled and joined his wife as he observed Ichigo's eyes begin to flutter. His young pawn stared at the ceiling for a moment before letting out a groan and putting a hand over his eyes. His smile widening, Surzich has asked, hey there. How are you feeling? Uncovering his eyes, Ichigo's eyes flickered to the red-headed devil, to Grafia and then back to him. How long? Eyes shimmering in amusement, Surzich's answered. Were you out? A little under eleven hours. Ichigo let out another groan and made to sit up. There goes my morning financial analytics class. Grafia put an arm on Ichigo's shoulder to steady him. Surzich's lightly snorted, I'm sure you'll manage. As Ichigo stood up, he fumbled and both Surzich's and Grafia reached out to keep him standing. Easy there, Surzich's said softly. Don't overdo it. Your body still needs time to adapt to its new adjustments. Ichigo fixed his gaze to Grafia. Sorry about this, he said with a sheepish smile. I'm Ichigo Kurosaki by the way. Grafia acknowledged him with a nod. Grafia Lucifuge, queen to Surzich's Lucifer and mate of the Grimmery family. Then, with a fleeting smile, she added. It's of no trouble. She's also my wife, Surzich's sighed as he set Ichigo back on the bed. Yet she always chooses to forego that one in her introductions. Ichigo let out a small laugh, but Surzich's had to force himself not to react as Grafia sharply stepped on his toes. Do you remember what I told you about the peerage system? 
the crimson Lucifer said as he suddenly flexed toes. Queen is in charge in absence of the king, right? Serzich has dipped his head. Very good. There will be times where I will be too occupied to personally give out orders. I rely on Grafia to communicate with the others at times like those. Also, any problems you have can be addressed to her. She will do her best to help you adjust to your new life. I am always available if you have any inquiries, Kurosaki-san, Grafia said as she stood straight and folded her hands in front of herself. Ichigo is fine, Grafia-san. The young man said. I'm not really big on formalities. Serzich's had to suppress a laugh as his wife's lips twisted in displeasure briefly. As you wish. Now, Lucifer began. It's best we discuss your living arrangements for the time being. Living arrangements. That is correct, Ichigo-kun. Your powers have returned, and while you have a better idea of what you are capable of than I do, you are wholly unfamiliar with demonic powers and how to safely use them. I see, Ichigo said as he frowned. Which is why I want you to spend the next week here in the underworld. Ichigo looked around the room with wide eyes. We're in the underworld right now. He asked in astonishment. Serzich's lips quirked as he nodded. It's a lot more cleaner than I expected. Serzich's chuckled. Let me guess, your thoughts were more along fire and brimstone. Ichigo gave a sheepish laugh and rubbed the back of his head. Yeah sorry about that. Anyways, Serzich's said good-naturedly. I want you to work on controlling your powers. You probably don't notice it right now, but you're leaking a steady dose of demonic power even as we speak. Ichigo's eyes widened and he placed a palm to his chest. He was. He didn't feel anything at the moment. Then again, he had the same problem with his spiritual powers. He returned his gaze back to Serzich's. In the underworld, other devils will think that you're openly challenging them if you constantly give off power the way you're doing now. And in the human world, you'd probably hospitalize several humans who'd get very sick simply by standing near you. That's not good Ichigo said as his face twisted into a scowl. No, not good at all. Which is why, Serzichu snapped his fingers and a crimson circle appeared on the ground behind him. A man, who only seemed a few years older than Ichigo, rose out of the glowing circle. He had black hair with streaks of blonde that fell in wave around his shoulders. A thin, shallow smile plastered over his lips gave him a very unsettling image. McGregor here will be teaching you how to control your newfound powers. If possible, the man's smile become even creepier. McGregor Mathers, Mr. Kurosaki. A pleasure to meet our newest member. McGregor here, Serzich's gestured towards the man. Is my one and only bishop. He's considered a chief figure in the magical community, and his abilities are unrivaled. You stand to gain a lot under his tutelage. You flatter me, my lord, the man said with a bow. I cannot, however, compare in terms of wizardry to yourself or Lord Beelzebub. Well, Ajuka and I have a few centuries on you, Serzich's waved him off. I'm sure within another hundred years or so, you'll surpass me, at least in terms of skill. It's a pleasure to meet you Mr. McGregor, Ichigo inclined his head. However, his face scrunched in confusion for a moment. Did I just speak English? Ah, notice did you, Mathers said with a glint in his eyes. All devils have an inborn ability to flawlessly speak and understand any language that is known to their kind. Sadly, this only extends to vocal communication. You will have to learn how to read and write a language on your own. Serzich's clapped his hands together and beamed. See? McGregor is a natural-born teacher. Already he's filling your head with useful information. Grafia cleared her throat and grabbed the attention of all three men. As we have breached the topic of languages, Kuro Ichigo, it is imperative you learn how to read and write in the native tongue of devils. You will be forced to carry out several duties in an official capacity as a member of Serzich's Sama's peerage. Very true, Serzich's cupped his chin. One of the downsides to this job is all the boring work, but you'll get used to it quick enough. Also, while we are on the subject of education, Grafia said. I believe it would be best if you switch to online classes. At least for the next few months as commuting between the underworld and earth will be rather cumbersome. Ichigo blinked in surprise. You mean I'm still going to go to university? Ichigo nearly recoiled as Grafia's eyes flashed with sharpened steel. Ichigo-kun, she started austerely. Education is a very important thing. I will not stand for a young man in my care to laze around. Are we clear? See Crystal, he stuttered. HMPH, good. She nodded. She turned towards the other two, who both flinched as their gaze met hers. I must excuse myself. There are many things which require my attention, and I expect the both of you to return your respective duties once Ichigo has settled in. Oh of course. Yes, M ma'am. With one last glare, Grafia walked out the room and all three men watched carefully. As soon as the door clicked shut, they let out a breath that none of them knew they were holding in. As frightening as ever, Mathers muttered. How you manage to fall in love with her is beyond me, my master. Sometimes I wonder myself, Serzich's responded with a chill. After a tense moment, the older two devils both turned towards Ichigo. Well Ichigo, Mathers said. If you're feeling up to it, we could begin right away. 
If not, we'll have a servant take you to your quarters and we can begin tomorrow. Ichigo smirked. Trust me, I'm all reared to get going now. Very good, Mathers smiled. Let's get going, shall we? Ichigo stood, grabbing hold of Mathers' outstretched hand, and a glowing light encircled them. When Serzichas stepped in with them, both of them looked at him expectantly. I think I'll join the two of you, he said with a pleasant smile. Mathers, on the other hand looked very perturbed by the idea. I'm not so sure about that sir. Don't worry, Serzichas waved dismissively. What Grafia doesn't know won't hurt her. But less her getting hurt and more her doing the hurting, that is me worried, the magician said under his breath. A very unpleasant sensation gripped Ichigo as he felt himself being compressed uncomfortably from all sides. Suddenly the world spun and he was on the ground. Ah, sorry about that. He heard Mathers say. It's always the worst the first few times. Don't worry, you'll get used to it. That's good to know, Ichigo said, doing his best to keep his previous meal down. As he took notice of his surroundings, he realized that they were no longer in the room he was laying in. Instead, they were in wide clearing surrounded trees. Where are we? Ichigo asked, looking around. A few miles away from my personal residence, Serzichas explained. The forest is stocked with all sorts of monsters for target practice purposes. So, Ichigo said slowly. How are we doing this? First, Mathers said, holding up a finger. We'll begin by having you draw upon your power. Once you get the hang of calling it forth, it becomes easier suppressing it. You heard him, Ichigo-kun, go ahead and let loose. All right, Ichigo nodded and closed his eyes. He felt that sorely missed hum of power deep within him and let it flood through. As he opened his eyes, the entire clearing was swept in a tide of swirling crimson energies laced with black. The grass beneath his feet burned away and the ground blackened as it dies. The friction from his power began to scorch the dirt and set deep cracks within the land. Well, Mathers said, his eyebrows well into his hairline. I can see why you brought him into the club. He can easily crush probably every high-class devil. That's quite enough, Ichigo-kun, Serzich's expression one of immense satisfaction. Ichigo nodded as he reined in his power and drew it back into himself. Perfect. Right there. Mather's sudden exclamation startled Ichigo. Just now, as you brought your power into yourself, that is the key to keeping your power suppressed. It will require conscious effort on your part in the beginning, but eventually it will become like second nature. Ichigo frowned. It certainly did require quite a bit effort for him to keep it all bottled away. If anything, it felt incredibly disagreeable to his person. You're having a difficult time because of your great strength, Ichigo-kun, Serzichas said, as if reading his thoughts. Most people learn to control the power they have as they gradually gain strength. For you, who grows in leaps and bounds, it is a very challenging thing to do. Ichigo's face contorted with concentration, and he continued to suppress his power within his own body. Now if you are willing to satisfy my curiosity, Serzichas said with a wicked smile. Would you try to draw upon your demonic power and only your demonic power? Ichigo frowned but said, I'll try. He knew how to differentiate between his powers. He was forced to do so when he needed to fight off control from his hollow. Back then, it became exceedingly difficult to draw on his inner strength without calling out the hollow. Reaching deep within himself, he dived into the massive reservoir of power that swam within him. Pulling and twisting it, he slowly tried to untangle the separate fonts that his powers originated from. He could practically feel Zanjetsu's displeasure as he unwounded from the mutation piece that gave him his demonic powers. Setting aside the grumpy spirit, he drew on the power of Serzich's piece and let it out. Mathers gave an approving nod. Good, now, he pointed towards the trees. See if you can release only it. Eyes narrowing in concentration, shadows of Alquiora flashed in his mind as he pointed his index finger towards the forest. Smoldering orange and red waves compressed at the tip of his finger until they formed a tight sphere glowing threateningly. From the corner of his vision, he could see both Mathers and Serzichas looking on curiously. Ichigo placed his gaze back on the ominous orb in front of his finger. Giving it a slight push, the orb went racing into the trees, and Ichigo lost sight of its glow in the darkness. A moment passed before his entire line of sight was consumed in a flash of bright light as a massive wall of flame erupted and tore into the sky. The wind whipped at gale four speeds, and several trees were uprooted and blown overhead. The sheer heat from the explosion caused Ichigo to draw on his power and shield himself. As the surge lessened and the ground stopped trembling, Ichigo turned towards the other two. Serzichas held a hand aloft in front of his face, shielding his eyes, while Mathers looked on, shock coating his face. Oh dear, Serzichas murmured just loud enough for Ichigo to hear. Wasn't quite expecting that. Lucifer's rotting corpse. Mathers exclaimed. Excuse me. Serzichas said indignantly. That's that's hellfire. How in the name of all that is unholy can you wield that monstrosity of all things? I took in hell's power several years ago. I guess it just stuck with me. Ichigo shrugged. What? Mather's eyes bugged out of his head. You can't do that. No one can do that. Even our master can't do that. 
it's impossible to manipulate hell. The only way for something like that sweet Lilith. Bathers pointed a trembling hand at Ichigo. D don't tell me that hell accepted you without damning your soul. Is it really that big of a deal? I mean, aren't devils the rulers of hell? Surely there are tons of people who can use this stuff. Ichigo said in confusion. I think you're misunderstanding something Ichigo-kun, Serzichas drew Ichigo's attention with a wry smile. Well it's true that we devils have a unique affinity for hell, and that the underworld is a separate part of hell that we live in, the reality is that, I rule hell because hell allows me to. Hell allows. Ichigo was beyond bewildered at this point. Hell is far older than our race. In fact, hell is older than even the mortal world. When my predecessor fell, he how do I say it made a deal with hell. In a way, it's a sentient entity. A deal, Ichigo's face fell into shock. Serzichas nodded. In return for its dark power, our race would serve as the wardens of the sinners of creation. The Kushinata may obey me, but that's only because I reaffirmed the deal that my predecessor made. You are the only person in all of creation that hell ever willingly helped out. Ichigo continued to look slack-jawed at Serzichas, causing the redhead to chuckle. Trust me, I may be Lucifer, but you're much closer to the title of devil than anyone in history. And that includes the Morning Star, himself. That that's not a comforting thought. No, I suppose it isn't, Serzich's sighed, his expression unnaturally grim. And the Lord of Hell is not one to be denied. Wah? Ichigo stared at Serzich's cryptic words. Never mind, Mather said, quickly shaking his head. Nothing good will come of that line of thoughts. For now, let us return to your powers. Ichigo swallowed hard but decided to push down any questions for now. Perhaps, once he learned to control his powers better, he could begin to understand them in depth. Your demonic powers are advanced. Very advanced. While your massive reserves are noteworthy, what truly stands out is the sheer density of them. I suppose this is the byproduct of Riatsu as you call it. Now, Mathers intoned seriously. Let us see how much of your former powers have returned. Yes, Serzichas agreed. I am also quite curious as to how much of your spiritual powers have returned. If you can use your demonic powers in tangent to your spiritual ones, I dare say, you'll be promoted to ultimate class by the end of the week. Ichigo acquiesced and once again, dove into his own being. Touching that part of his soul, he gave an exasperated smile. Your turn. Ja. Ichigo instantly felt a weight appear in his hand. He looked down and beheld a sheathed sword. It was the same one he used to battle Zanjetsu in his inner world except it was bone white now. In fact, it looked disturbingly like an Aranker Zampakin. He drew the guardless sword and summoned the power from within the confines of his soul. A minute passed. Then two. The three, Serzichas and Mathers began to exchange glances. Ichigo. Serzichas asked cautiously in the face of Ichigo's fluctuating spiritual pressure. Is there something wrong? I Ichigo looked utterly lost for a moment. I have absolutely no fucking clue on how to release my Zanpakuten. Well this was embarrassing. He knew his Zanpakuten's name, he knew its Bankai and Hell, he even mastered it to a point where a super-powered Aizen could only touch him if Ichigo let him. However he had no shitting way of knowing his release phrase for his Shikai. He never needed one. Umbus. Ichigo's body moved on autopilot and his aura flared all the way into the dark clouds of the underworld. Riatsu flooded the world and Mathers and Serzichas could only stand by exerting their own capable auras. Arm raised above, Zanjetsu in its new form pointing skywards, Ichigo's lips moved of their own accord. Resurrection. Chapter 3. Descent. That ought to do it, Ichigo said as he hit the submit button. Rafia had proven herself to be quite the efficient worker as she had, through unknown means, managed to switch him over to online courses. Even though it was in the middle of the semester. She really was quite something. Grafia, or Nisan as he had come to call her, was beyond helpful in adjusting to his new life within the underworld. He had become so immersed with learning to manage his new powers, as well as the intricacies of devil society, that the one week he was to spend in the underworld had become three. Three weeks that were spent in the constant company of Grafia, McGregor or Serzichas. The intimidating maid had been put in charge of his lessons, which had really made Ichigo uncomfortable. Considering how busy the woman was, he felt bad that she had to take time out of her insane schedule to teach him something mundane as the alphabet and how to properly use a spoon. McGregor, strange individual that he was, continued to educate him on the manipulation of demonic energy and had given him several simple exercises to help. As Ichigo had become accustomed to them, he had begun to teach Ichigo some of the beginner spells that most magicians use. Most of them were simple things such as how to use the teleportation spell on his own, levitating small objects, and using his newfound wings to fly about. Ichigo had found the whole process to be relatively easy. Honestly, why couldn't Urahara had thought up of doing these kinds of things with him during the war with Aizen? It would have made controlling his raging Riatsu so much easier. A slight chime broke Ichigo out his thoughts, and he turned his attention back to his laptop. 
a small window popped up confirming that his submission had been received and that he would receive an email as proof. Logging off and shutting down his browser, Ichigo's thoughts drifted back to his powers. The change in Zanjetsu had been startling. While he knew that his Hollow and Zanjetsu were one and the same now, he hadn't realized that his powers would do a complete 180. Serzich has theorized that, since hollows are far more closely related to hell than Shinigami, his powers had reversed. The source of his powers had been, initially, of Shinigami origins laced with hollow powers. Now, Zanjetsu was entirely hollow with traces of Shinigami powers. He likened it to turning into an Aranker when he used to be a Bizard. Thank Lucifer. He didn't have to deal with having a hollow hole. That would be one awkward conversation if it ever came up with his family and friends. Not to mention, Soul Society would probably strap him down to a dissection table. Thankfully, Serzichas had informed him that an understanding had been reached with Japan's government the supernatural one, to be precise. Soul Society could no longer touch him without triggering a massive war that they couldn't afford. Especially considering that a good chunk of the captains would side with him. Ichigo leaned back in his chair and wound both of his hands behind his head. His life had changed so much in just mere three weeks. He had gone from the bleak existence of a college student to a hellfire-wielding devil. He blinked the daze out of his eyes for a moment as realization settled over him. This was like Rukio all over again someone pops up in his life and flips it entirely upside down into a storybook tale. Ironically, he was now considered the villain in the fairy tale. It definitely has been a strange three weeks Ichigo thought Riley. He had ended up meeting two other peers from Serzich's peerage. One of whom was Saoji Akita. Ichigo had been floored when he was introduced to the former captain of the Shinsengumi Squad 1. A legendary figure from the Meiji era of Japanese history, it seemed the old tales of Saoji summoning demons were true after all. He had spoken with Serzich's only night at great length about each other's personal history. Their conversation had concluded with a spar between the two swordsmen. For Ichigo, it had been an incredible moment. The speeds that the former Shinsengumi captain was capable of traveling rivaled, if not surpassed, what his old teacher, Yoruchi, was capable of. And then there had been his meeting with one of Serzich's rooks. The one that was considered the strongest in the underworld. Serger II, the clone fire giant from Realm of the Norse. It had been a surreal moment when both had met and realized that the other had orange hair. An odd kinship had been born. One that had Mathers commenting on, overpowered fire-wielding oranges. Suffice it to say, he was getting along with his fellow peerage members. All that was left was for him to meet his fellow pawns and the last rook. A moment of silence passed as Ichigo went over the past few weeks in his head. Suddenly, he craned his neck towards the door and spoke out neutrally. You know you don't have to stand out there, he said, causing Anit to drift from the other side of the door. Feel free to come inside. The door creaked open and a small mop of red hair peeked from behind the door. Delicate boyish feature morphed into a sheepish expression and familiar sea green eyes caused him to sit forward. Ichigo blinked in confusion. Had Serzich's managed to de-age himself somehow? Serzich's? Ichigo called cautiously. The young boy looked surprised for a moment before smiling. Ah, my apologies, he said with a polite bow. My name is Milikas Gremory, son of Serzich's Lucifer. Ichigo's eyebrows rose an inch of surprise flitted across his face. Really now, Ichigo said as he leaned back his chair once again. Neither Serzich's nor Nisa mentioned a son. An odd twinge crossed the boy's face, yet he quickly schooled his expression back into a mask of politeness. My parents are very busy people, Milika said, though Ichigo caught the slight gloom in his tone. The brief flash of sympathy stirred through Ichigo as memories of a dead mother and an absent father climbed through his mind. Deciding to change the subject for the boy's own benefit, Ichigo asked, is there any particular reason you're standing outside my door? Instantly, Milika's cheeks were dusted with a light pink, and Ichigo had to hold in a light chuckle. I, uh, ahem, Milika's coughed into his hand. I was curious to meet Otu-sama's new pawn piece. It isn't every day that a Satan brings a new piece into their fold. He then gained a wide smile, one Ichigo could tell was genuine. And I wanted to welcome you to the family. Ichigo let out the chuckle he had held in as he stood up and walked over to Serzich's young son. He held out his hand, and the boy shook it with an even wider smile. Name's Ichigo Kurosaki. Why don't you come inside? Milikas nodded eagerly and quickly walked into Ichigo's room. He sat down on one of the many sofas provided by Grafia. Ichigo noted with amusement that, for all his polite mannerism, Milikas gazed about his room with a childish wonder. The young boy's mother had all of Ichigo's personal items moved from his apartment to his new room in Serzich's personal manner. A brief smile drifted across Ichigo's lips as Milikas gaze stopped with awe at the sight of his guitar. Undoubtedly, a child of Milikas' mannerisms has never seen a guitar in real life before. So, what can I do for you, Ichigo said as he sat down. Ah, a nervous expression crossed his face. I was wondering if I could ask a few things. Go ahead. Ichigo nodded, amusement growing by the moment. 
Really the young boy's face lighting up with glee. Are you really from Japan? Were you really a reaper of souls? What do souls look like? What kind of powers do you have? Ichigo began to laugh as Milikas fired off question after question. Slow down there kid. Shifting in his chair so that he could get comfortable, Ichigo said, let's go one at a time, how about it? Despite the blush of mortification, Milikas nodded his head eagerly. Well, yeah, I'm Japanese. Born and raised there for the last 19 or so years. That's so amazing. Milikas had stars in his eyes. I've always wanted to go to Japan. Saoji makes it sound like a wonderful place, and Ria's 1E Sama says it is the best place in the human world. The moment of confusion passed Ichigo before he asked, you call your aunt 1E Sama. Milikas nodded. Well, she is closer in age to me than to Otu Sama. Ichigo hummed in understanding. With a sister several centuries younger than him, it was no surprise that Serzich's treated her no different than his own young son. That is to say, as childishly as possible. How old are you, exactly? I'm nine years old. Milika said proudly. Ichigo offered an indulgent smile and gave an affirmative nod. Nine ha I remember those days, he muttered gaining a distant look in his eyes. So why is it that this the first time we've met? You don't live here? I do, the boy said shaking his head. But I was staying over at my grandparents' house. Ah, Ichigo said absentmindedly. I see. So were you really the Grim Reaper? Ichigo fell out of past thoughts at the expectant look of admiration on Milika's face. Well, I guess but, we referred to ourselves as Shinigami. Eh? Surprise took hold of the youth's face, only to be replaced with a wild look of wonder. There are more of you. The smile briefed Ichigo's lips, even as a pang of melancholy hit his heart. He was reminded too much of Karen and Yuzu when they were at that age. Pushing aside the painful sense of nostalgia, Ichigo began explaining the fundamentals of the afterlife, or at least how it works in Japan. For the next hour or so, Ichigo regaled Milikas with tales of Soul Society and Hueco Mundo. The two of them fell into a comfortable flow, one that Ichigo found was both alien yet welcome to him. I guess this is what it feels like to have a little brother. Once Ichigo had explained most of the basics to Milikas, his questions changed to more personal ones. Eventually, his gaze returned to the guitar. Do you play? He asked with near unrestrained excitement. It's why I have one, Ichigo said, eyes shining with mirth. Can you show me? At this point, Milikas was nearly jumping up and down in his seat, and Ichigo knew that he would feel quite guilty if he said no to all that expectancy. Sure. Serzichas let out a tired sigh as he rose out of the magic circle. It had been another long day at the office. Surely, if the humans knew what a cumbersome job being the devil was, he'd probably no longer be feared and reviled across the globe. If anything, he'd garner their sympathy. Welcome home, Millard. He turned to see one of his many maids bowing to him. The fact that Grafia wasn't here to greet him meant that she was caught up with something at the main manse. He let out another tired sigh. May I be of assistance, master? No no, he said tiredly. It's nothing. Shall I draw up a bath then, master? She asked. Please do, but first, he said while straining the crick in his neck. Is Ichigo available? I'd like to speak with him. Lord Ichigo is within his chambers, entertaining the young master. That surprised him. His brow raised in question, Milikas. He's here. Yes, master. Serzich's brow furrowed. Neither Grafian nor his mother mentioned that his son would be dropping by and, for that matter, who was currently supervising him. Not only that but, he was certainly confident in the fact that Milikas should be having his lessons with his personal tutors. Just what was his son doing here? Ah, who cares? He gets to see his son after so long. And Ichigo's with him so everything should be fine. You said that they're in Ichigo's room? He asked, somewhat, sharply. Yes, Millard, she said, quickly bowing. Serzich's lips parted in a wide smile and with preternatural speed, he dashed off in the direction of Ichigo's room. As he arrived in the corridor he had given to Ichigo, Serzich's idly noted that he left skid marks in the carpet as he came to a stop. Not that he really cared. Walking down the corridor, Serzich's could hear the sound of a guitar rising out of the ajar door to Ichigo's personal quarters. The grim sounds of doom from the distortion filled Serzich's with a sense of warmth that invigorated his weary self. He felt the stress accumulated throughout the day simply melt away. Suddenly the guitar picked up and he could hear the doomsy low wail of the Prince of Darkness himself. Serzich's was in the doorframe in a second and looked wide-eyed at the sight before him. Ichigo's laptop was playing one his all-time favorites, while his youngest servant fingers fretted away with one hand, while the other gingerly touched a pick to guitar strings. His newest pawn was a fucking musician with actual taste in music. Oh hell yes. He hit the jackpot with Ichigo Kurosaki. Screw Madarasu, the elders and Serafal with all their complaints. He'd go to war if it meant keeping this kid. An abrupt clapping and childish laugh brought him back to hell. His eyes darted to the other side of the room, and Serzich's clutched his chest as his heart throbbed painfully. 
The Prince of Lies felt tears well up as his soft sea green eyes misted over. He was Lucifer he wasn't supposed to get emotional, but this this. It was too much for his black, shriveled up heart. His son, his pride and joy, was slowly rocking his head to the heavy doom and gloom of Ichigo's guitar. Tears finally spilled over, and he sniffled as a great sense of accomplishment settled over him. Unholy shit. Where was his bloody camera? He needed to get a picture of this. Wait a minute. My phone has a camera. He pulled out his cell from his voluminous robes, and the moment he flicked the screen on, it gave him a message. Battery is critically low. Please place on charge. Then the screen went black. Ah, dot, 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 damn you to the deepest pits of me. Otusama. Ichigo's playing stopped and Serzich's looked up from his dead phone to see a crimson missile heading towards him at terminal velocity. Oof, he flinched as Milika's impact nailed him right in the diaphragm. Otusama. His son cried happily. When did you arrive? Oh, I've been watching for a while, Serzich's said through a strained smile as he patted his son's identical crimson locks. You should have said some Serzich's looked up as Ichigo stopped halfway through his sentence. He was surprised to see the teen was scrutinizing him. Are you are you crying? Don't be ridiculous, Serzich's scoffed, immediately vaporizing his tears with his powers of destruction. So what have you two rascals been up to? Ichigo scowled at the description, but Milikas beamed up at him. Naisama was telling me about the Japanese afterlife. Serzich's looked at his son with curiosity. Naisama. He asked with interest. Judging by Ichigo's expression, he was just as surprised as him at the epithet. Yes, his young son bobbed his head up and down eagerly. And then, Ichigo Naisama showed me how he played guitar. He's really good Otu-sama. So I've heard, Serzich said as he kneeled down and picked up his son, much to the boy's childish delight. You never told me you played Ichigo-kun. He said, turning to face the young devil. Ichigo merely shrugged. It never came up. So how was today? Uneventful as ever. You have no idea, Serzich sighed. Just the mere thought of the office brought a wave of fatigue over him. Dealing with politicians is bad. Dealing with devils who are politicians is even worse. Are they really that bad, Otusama? Milikas asked, his face scrunching up in an absolute adorable way. Not really knowing how to explain the convolutions of politics to his nine-year-old son, Serzichas simply said, imagine people who hide their real face and keep on running their own rat race. Judging by the wrinkling of his nose, Milikas became even more confused. I don't understand. Lucky you, Serzichas whispered too quietly for his son to hear. Now, enough talk of boring, stuffy old men. Serzichas exclaimed before giving his son a knowing look. How about we listen to some music? Milikas looked like the apocalypse had come early. Really? Otusama. Of course, Serzichas smiled as he put Milikas down. Now Serzichas tapped his chin. Where did I leave my guitar? Rafia had no idea what had gotten into her son. He was always her darling little boy. Obeying every word to the letter. Never giving her trouble, always doing as he was told and giving her the smug satisfaction that her son was better than every other devil of his generation. So what, in the name of her husband, had convinced him to run away and skip out on his lessons. Having had the entirety of the Gremory Palace checked over resulted in the conclusion that Milikas was nowhere within the confines of the property. After giving his handlers a proper thrashing, she ran a mental list of places that he would have run off to, and the only place she could logically assume would be his father's personal manse. Having moved out after becoming Lucifer, Serzich's had the mansion built just for the two of them after they had married. Appearing at the mansion via summoning circle, she was immediately greeted by one of the staff. Good afternoon madam, the goat-headed butler received. May I be of assistance? Instinctively running her eye over the butler, checking his uniform and making sure that everything was in proper order, she asked, have you seen Milikas? Her irate having to search for him in the first place served to do away with her maid persona. She was in full queen mode as of that moment. The young master is currently engaged with the prince and Lord Ichigo. The butler replied with a bow. While she wasn't surprised to find her husband involved in this affair, the mentioning of her new charge gave her pause. Ichigo-kun? She asked, raising a delicate eyebrow. Yes, madam, the demon butler never looking up from the ground. The young master, Milikas, sent for a servant to guide him to Lord Ichigo's chambers upon his immediate arrival. Milikas came to see Ichigo. Well that was a surprise. She vaguely remembered Milikas making inquiries about his father's newest piece. Still, she found it disconcerting that Milikas would simply sneak off without telling anyone. Had he simply asked, she would have introduced her son to the newly reincarnated devil. In fact, she would have done so gladly. Ichigo was a hard-working young man who took his studies seriously. Not only would he be a good influence on Milikas but he would also provide some much-needed company. Poor Milikas had few that he could call friends due to his station. She also knew that it would be a good thing for Ichigo to have someone to anchor him in a more delicate manner. Surrounded by the monsters of Serzich's peerage, Ichigo would quickly degrade and lose any and all functionality for proper civilization. 
Unholy Four knew that the rest of her fellow servants were utterly inept at anything outside of battle. She would roll over dead before allowing a young man of Ichigo's caliber to fall into decadence. Breaking herself away from her thoughts, she looked back down at the butler. He is still with Ichigo-kun, then. Yes, madam. The prince joined them not but 15 minutes ago. This meant her son had spent 15 minutes, unsupervised, with his father. Who knows the amount of damage her lovable idiot of a husband had managed to inflict. Very well then, you may go, she said dismissively while traversing down the corridor. Her lithe form flickered through the unnatural lighting of the underworld until she arrived at the portion of mansion that was gifted to Ichigo as his personal residence. The moment she entered the vaunted hall, a brief frown marred her mouth as she took notice of black scorch marks across the luxurious carpet. Grafia rolled her eyes. The damage had Serzich's written all over it. Loud noises of dark grooves assaulted her ears and exasperation crept into her veins. Grafia knew she wouldn't like what she would soon be witness to. Stepping under the threshold of Ichigo's room, her eyes twitched in annoyance at the sight before her. Ichigo sat in his leather chair at his desk, a sleek black guitar on his leg and an indulgent smirk on his face. The warmth and genuine sincerity in his eyes briefly distracted her from her ire and made her content in knowing that the young man in her care was properly adjusting. She was honestly worried about the youngest of the peerage, as she could tell that he held on to some impressive burdens of his own. Seeing him like this brought forth the same affection she usually felt every time Milikas exceeded the expectations of his tutors. However, the moment she turned her eyes to man next to Ichigo, her annoyance renewed itself with incensed vigor. The sight of her husband, her centuries-old husband, fooling around on a guitar when he had other more important matters to deal with was vexing to say the least. Then there was the fact that her son was looking up at the childish man with something akin to hero worship. And that guitar she was positive she threw it out decades ago. Grafia pinched a bridge of her nose. This won't do she thought dourly. This won't do at all. Grafia held out her hand in the direction of Serzich's. At the gathering of demonic power, both Ichigo and Serzich's went on edge and promptly whirled around towards her. Shame neither of them could do anything as a massive chunk of ice smashed into Serzich's and sent him crashing through the window. Grafia smirked vindictively as she heard her husband scream girlishly as he fell down four stories. Now that was music to her ears. And Ni Sanchi schooled her features, but she knew her eyes were shining in dark fulfillment. Ichigo swallowed hard in the face of her facade. But give her a few more months, and Grafia would have him suitably educated. Then, once he was a proper gentleman, she could see about finding the boy a nice girl to set him up with. Leaving a young man of their race to his own devices for long periods of time was only asking for disaster. Akasama. She turned towards her wayward child who was about to throw himself at her however, a single glance froze him in place. Milikas, she began coolly. You skipped your lessons. Instantly, regret formed on her child's face, and he cast a downward gaze. I'm sorry, he mumbled. If you wanted to meet with Ichigo-kun, she continued. You only need have asked. Someone would have accompanied you. After your lessons would have concluded. She did not enjoy the tears forming in her son's eyes, nor did she take comfort in knowing she was the cause of them. However, both Serzich's and Grafia had a lot of enemies. For Milikas to go unaccompanied anywhere, it was well beyond the realm of dangerous. At least until he grew into his powers and was properly able to defend himself, they would have to keep him under constant surveillance. Wait a minute, Grafia turned towards Ichigo as he stood up and set his guitar aside. I'm partly at fault here, Nissan. I should have realized that Milikas came here without any permission when he suddenly showed up without anyone with him. If anyone is to blame it's me. His face set with grim determination, Grafia saw Ichigo in a new light. She fraught off a twitch at the corners of her mouth. The fine young man indeed. Be that as it may, Ichigo-kun, Grafia shifted her weight and placed a hand on her hip. Milikas knows the consequences of traveling alone. It is not safe for him. Ichigo opened his mouth to protest however, Grafia cut him off by raising her hand. However, seeing as how nothing happened and Milikas did immediately find an adult the moment he arrived, I will withhold any punishment. When her son looked up with a wide smile, all too reminiscent of his father, Grafia narrowed her eyes and added. For now. Her stern warning nevertheless went widely ignored as her son wrapped his arms around her waist in a tight hug. She let a small smile of exasperated fondness creep onto her lips as she heard his muffled apologies against her uniform. Allowing herself to indulge fleetingly, Grafia ran a hand through Milika's hair. Quick enough though, she pried the boy away from her and snapped her fingers. A maid appeared at Ichigo's door and Grafia said, go and eat your lunch Milika's. Afterwards, I will have Enku escort you back to you lessons. Milika's expression fell rather swiftly and he shuffled out the door behind the maid, although, not before turning around and bidding farewell. Goodbye Naisama. I had fun. I hope we can talk again. Grafia blinked at the way Milika's addressed Ichigo though, it was hastily replaced with amusement. Ichigo's smile and responsive sure only increased her sense of mirth.
She watched Milika's and the maid until they disappeared down the corridor. She turned back towards Ichigo, her face all business and said, I apologize if Milika's caused you trouble. He's normally not one to shirk off his studies. Children will be children, Ichigo shrugged. Speaking of which, neither of you told me you had a kid. Ah, Grafia could hear the slight accusation in Ichigo's tone, and, truthfully, it felt strange for her to be admonished for a change. We were so occupied with other things it must have slipped our minds. Grafia was surprised when Ichigo's lips tightly thinned into the beginning of a frown. He opened his mouth, as if to say something yet, simply sighed tiredly and ran a hand through his long orange locks. Grafia blinked a few times before cautiously inquiring, is there something wrong? No, it's nothing, Ichigo shook his head as he walked towards the shattered window and peered over the edge. I'll have the window repaired as soon as possible, she immediately said upon realizing that the entirety of the room was now bare to the elements. Though her voice held no inflection of it, she was slightly ashamed at the damage she had done so blatantly. Taking a moment, she regained her strict bearings and asked sharply, I'm going to assume that Serzich's did not inform you of your first task. Ichigo crossed his arm with an expectant look. Task. We have received reports of a human necromancer attempting a powerful summoning. She informed him. At least three sinners have been confirmed to being resurrected. And I'm supposed to go and send them packing back to pits, right? Ichigo asked. Rafia nodded. Serzich has informed me that he had already spoken to you of such occurrences and how it will be your duty to rectify them. Yeah, Ichigo said, looking up at the ceiling in recollection. It was one of the first things he brought up with me when we initially met. Very well then, she nodded. We shall leave after eating lunch, ourselves. We? Ichigo looked at her in surprise. She permitted a wry curl of her lips as she began to walk out of his room. Your first demonic incursion into the human world would be well to be supervised. Especially for such a delicate matter. It wouldn't do to have you burn down an entire village. Ichigo gave her a dry look as he moved to follow her. I lost control of my powers once, once. You burned several acres of land. She stated pointedly. Ichigo merely sighed in defeat from behind her. Queen Leda's pawn followed, and the two made their way down to the dining area to join Milika's. Every now and then however, Grafia cast a sideways glance at her youngest charge. Eventually, Ichigo noticed and inquired as to why she kept looking at him. Her response. You are in need of a haircut. Ichigo groaned. Grafi and Ichigo both stepped out of the crimson circle and proceeded to walk out of the alley they had teleported to. She cast a glance up and down the busy street. Where are we? Ichigo asked from behind her. In response, Grafia waved her hand towards the skyline. Ichigo followed her gesture until his eyes widened as he beheld the most dominant landmark on the horizon. Paris. He asked while staring at wonder at the Eiffel Tower. Indeed, she stated before sensing out their destination. She then gave him an expectant look. At his confused expression, she placed a hand on her hip and narrowed her eyes. Right, Ichigo sighed before mechanically repeating. All underworld activity in the Paris district is under the direct administration of the Salos family of the 72 pillars. When she raised an eyebrow, expecting more, Ichigo sighed in exasperation once again. The Salos family possess the rank of Great Duke. They are known as pacifists and generally avoid most conflict. They're also known for their production of love potions, aphrodisiacs and other promiscuous things. Trailing off towards the end, Grafia thought it was rather cute how the young man couldn't meet her eyes. Very good, she said, her eyes sparkling with mischief. You've been paying attention to your lessons. Her eyes then flickered to his hands that he was rubbing against one another. Are they uncomfortable? Huh? A brief bout of confusion flitted across his features before he followed her gaze to his hands. Ichigo's own line of sight fell onto them, and he noted the tribal-like tattoos on each wrist. They're slightly itchy. Let me see, she said while holding out her hand. As Ichigo placed his hands in her own, Grafia traced the markings on his wrist with her index finger. She sent a cool rush of magic within his skin to lessen the irritation. The markings were an insulator of sorts. Ichigo still hadn't fully managed to rein in his powers, and he was still liable to infect humans with his tremendous demonic presence. Of course they were only temporary. Ichigo's massive reserves would eventually burn right through them if given enough hours. Hum, let's be off shall we? She asked. Ichigo nodded his head and shoved his hands into the pockets of jeans and slouched his lean frame forward. Ichigo-kun, she said with a hint of censure, causing said young devil to flinch slightly. Do not slouch. As you say, Nisan. He said idly, straightening his back and blowing his bangs out of his eyes. She was about to chide him on his hair again when she caught sight of a man leering at her as they walked by. She fought the urge to roll her eyes. Man she thought in irritation. She had changed out of her maid uniform into a long flowing, sky blue skirt and white blouse. She wasn't about to walk the streets of Paris in a maid outfit. The catcalls were unnecessary to her work, though it seemed that it wouldn't have made much of a difference. She wound her arm with Ichigo's to dissuade any encouragement of human courting. 
She was pleased when Ichigo seemed to understand the situation quick enough as he did not raise any questions. Instead, Ichigo fixed a man with a dark glare that sent him scurrying. Grafia smiled to herself. Perhaps Ichigo didn't need too much work after all. He was a thousand times better than the rest of Serzich's peerage based on that small display alone. Those idiots would have allowed, if not openly encouraged, a man to approach her, if only for the entertainment value it would have provided them. Of course, she would have proceeded to thrash all of them, including the fool who dared to make a move on her. Hey, Nissan. Yes, Ichigo-kun. She turned to look up at him, his face still fixed in a shadowed scowl, scaring away both human males and females. She idly wondered if he knew what kind of effect he had on young women. Shouldn't we, I don't know, talk to Duke Salos before we go walking around in his territory? He asked. I am glad to see you thinking along those lines, Grafia dipped her head in approval. It is considered incredibly rude to simply flaunt into another's territory without asking permission. However, as it is, it was the Duke himself who requested aid in dealing with the necromancer, and I have already spoken with him prior to our arrival. Oh. As they continued to walk at a casual pace towards the necromancer's last known location, Grafia noticed that Ichigo had suddenly become on edge. Is everything all right, Ichigo-kun? There's a feeling in the air. His face twisted in concentration. Like there's a sense of decay waving around. Grafia looked at him in surprise. I'm impressed, Ichigo-kun. It seems your ability to sense auras has come along quite nicely. You mean you feel it too? He asked in befuddlement. As you must have noticed, the sun is set. She pointed out. Yeah, so? Paris, she switched into lecturing mode. Is host to the largest population of vampires outside of Romania. In the hours of dusk, they waken. It is them which you are sensing. Vampires? Ichigo muttered in awe. Indeed, Grafia said. The catacombs that run beneath the city are filled with the undead and their elk. Paris, unfortunately, has always suffered from an infestation of necromancers for this very reason. So you're telling me I'm going to be making frequent trips here? Ichigo asked. Not necessarily, no, she shook her head. Few necromancers possess the skill and power needed to reach into the bowels of hell. Most of today's necromancers can reanimate a corpse at best. To actually bring the soul back requires an in-depth knowledge of esoteric magic that takes centuries to accumulate. Ichigo blinked. Centuries. As in hundreds of years. I thought you said this guy was human. How did he manage to bring back sinners if it requires that much time to get to that level? Grafia sighed. Ultimately, the goal of necromancy, for most anyways, is immortality. Sadly, many human necromancers turn themselves into the undead as to keep themselves from dying. The look of revulsion crossed Ichigo's face, and upon catching it, Grafia nodded her head in agreement. Yes, it's a very disgusting practice. Turn left here. Grafia led Ichigo by the arm to the side of an old cobblestone building. Letting go of his arm, Grafia placed her palm on the stone wall and sent a pulse of magic. The spot beneath her hand glowed a light blue before the stones seemed to fold in on themselves, revealing a long staircase that descended into the underground quarries of Paris. The staircase was wide enough for the two devils to step downward simultaneously. After the first few steps, the entrance closed behind them, leaving them in a perpetual abyss. Even their enhanced supernatural vision failing in the complete absence of light. Hang on, Grafia heard Ichigo's voice echo from beside her. Suddenly, the staircase was illuminated in a dark orange glow as Ichigo held up a single fingertip encased in hellfire. Grafia noted that, even though it was barely the size of a candle flame, Ichigo's conjured fire brought the temperature up by several degrees. Almost to the point of uncomfortableness. She gained a whole new appreciation for the horrors of hellfire as she swept a thin layer of ice magic over her skin to keep herself cool. It took them quite some time to descend all the way to the bottom of the staircase. She estimated that they were at least a hundred meters underground. As soon as they reached the bottom though, the chamber that the staircase led to was engulfed in a fiery light as torches burst into flame. Guess my finger isn't needed anymore, Ichigo commented indolently from a cider. A brief bout of hellfire was put out, and both Grafia and Ichigo took in the sight of large cavernous walls lined with bones and human skulls. There, Grafia pointed out a passage underneath an arch of bones. As Ichigo moved forward, Grafia put a delicate touch on his shoulder. A moment, Ichigo come. He frowned at her and asked. What is it? She looked ahead of him and said, I want you to reach out with your magic to just a few feet to the front of us. His frown deepened, but she knew he acquiesced when she felt the thrum of his demonic magic wash over her. Carefully, she chided. Do not push your magic so forcibly, ease it to where you desired. The second passed and Ichigo's eyes lit with surprise. There's something there, he muttered softly as she nodded encouragingly. His brow furrowed in concentration. It's almost like like a wall. Well done, Grafia smiled gently. The necromancer has put up a magical war to trap any who cross it. In a painful manner too, I'd wager. How do we break it, determination setting in his eyes. 
She shook her head, in time, when your feel for the mystic develops further, you'll be able to realize that this barrier includes two other enchantments. One to alert the weaver that the trap has been sprung and the other to alert him if it is undone. So no powering through? He asked sweeping his long bangs. I'm afraid a more delicate hand is necessary in this situation, she said as her eyes shone in bemusement. But the practice tease brought by centuries, Grafia sent light tendrils of her demonic power to unravel the wards in reverse order. With a satisfied hum, she resumed forward and silently beckoned Ichigo to follow. For the next hour or so, the pair navigated through the labyrinth of the dead, attempting to find the mage marked for death by the underworld government. On and on they went, their only company the constant presence of the numerous corpses. Eventually, they stopped when the scent of rotting flesh and sickeningly sweet decay hit them. Raphia had to keep her nose from wrinkling, as the perverted and infectious magics in the air attempted to cling to her potent flesh. With a small curl of her lip, she brought up her dark power and pushed the foul energies away. She turned to make sure that Ichigo did the same however, a movement in the shadows of the room caught her attention. The figure came forward, wobbling and sifting through the murky water that had gathered at the other end of the area. That, Ichigo-kun, Grafia pointed with loathing. Is the result of the most vulgar of magecraft. Ichigo's face was contorted in a violent twist of disgust and revulsion. It was easily one of the most unsettling sights Grafia, herself, had seen. The necromancer's skin had long rotted away, leaving lumps of blackened and purple flesh that clung loosely to yellowed and cracked bones. Spider-like fingers, many broken and jagged, clawed over empty sockets and hollow bare teeth. Its voice came warped and gravelly, no doubt its vocal cords had decayed long ago, and only some sinister twisted magic allowed it to still imitate what crude speech it was capable of. Devils selfish greedy devils. Give us the secret. Isle rose within the silver-haired queen as she saw maggots drop from the undead slackened jaw. As you can see, Grafia noted with pure repugnance layering her voice. It's become completely insane in its single-minded pursuit of immortality. Ichigo made a noise in the back of his throat, and Grafia wasn't sure if he was agreeing with her or holding down his lunch. Erg. The necromancer let out a roar as it flung its arms up in the air, and a noxious miasma spilled forth from its shambling corpse. The air twisted with a malignant power, a complete anathema to all life within the bounds of creation. Grafia noticed with a macabre professional interest, three dark purple magic circles appeared before it. Her eyes narrowed. It's attempting to summon the sinners it let loose. Three skeletons rose forth, covered in a gleaming silver metal, and Grafia immediately recognized them as alchemical homunculi, used as necromantic mediums for souls. The homunculi began to fall into spasms as if they were in pain, and began to trash about violently as they fell to the floor. Violent and corrupt magics permeated the small chamber, centering on the metal skeletons. Dark power coalesced and began to form clusters of tissue and sinew. The skeletons were being coated in flesh as their bodies being made. Layers upon layers of muscle knotted and twisted. As their throats formed, soul-tearing screams ripped forth from their convulsing forms. Raphia, having fought in the Devil's Civil War, had witnessed unspeakable horrors that could have only been brought about by demons that her kind were. However, even after all those traumatizing and scarring years, this scene still made it difficult for her not to flinch away. And beneath her indifferent exterior and behind her disgust marred eyes, she worried that such an extreme experience would be too much for Ichigo so early on. The screaming gave way to labored heavy rasps for air, and Grafia saw how pale skin, pink and raw, had now formed over the homunculi. They were completely hairless, not a follicle on their bodies nor their heads. Two of them were male, while the third was female. Gasping for breath, the female took a glance behind her and sneered. So the freak brought us back. Wonder what shit it'll make us do this time. I'm guessing it has something to do with these two, the male on the left said. The other male wagged its tongue and leered at her while fondling itself. Now that's one haluva bird. I'd think I'd like to play with her. Ignoring them, Grafia said, remember Ichigo-kun, you must burn the sinners with your hellfire if they are to be returned to the fields of punishment. If not, we will have to drag them back the long way. When she didn't get a response, Grafia turned towards him and was shocked to see Ichigo with his head in in his hand. Concern immediately flooded her eyes. Ichigo-kun. What's wrong? She placed a hand on his shoulder and shook him. Ha. One of them's already lost it. The female sinner wheezed. Kyle, a maniacal light entered the sinner's eyes as a harsh pink light glowed from within their mouths. The bitch is mine. Grafia cast a quick glance towards the sinner before looking at Ichigo once more. What had happened to Ichigo? Why wasn't he responding? While she could effortlessly deal with the sinners and the necromancer, the whole point of this incursion was for Ichigo to do it. There is no escape. Grafia scrutinized Ichigo with fret as she barely made out his whisper. Had the sight of the necromancer and the raising of the dead been too much for the boy? It was then that the acidic smell of sulfur burned into her nostrils. Grafia yelped as she was forced to pull her hand off Ichigo's shoulder as it burned her. There is no mercy. 
the temperature in the underground chamber skyrocketed until the air became scalding and stifling. A suffocating pressure of malevolence and volcanic fury crushed down on all the occupants of the room. The heat generated from her young companion distorted the air and surrounded him in a violent haze. As Ichigo's hand fell away from his face and as he stood tall, Grafia was stunned by the change that overcame his features. Visage grim and cruel, Ichigo's eyes as raged in crimson hellfire. The shadows in the chamber twisted and arsed as if they had come to life and, while she had no idea of what had happened, the three sinners seemed to have fallen in a state of pure unadulterated terror. No, I'm not going back, I'm not going back the female sinner, shook her head frantically. She then shrieked. No. Fuck 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 fuck. You've got to be shitting me there's no way I'm heading back there. The crude male roared. Quickly. The third male shouted. Kill him. She gathered her demonic power as all three sinners gained a fanatic look in their eyes and rushed at Ichigo however, Ichigo himself deftly raised his arm and thick chains of black and metal, thrust from seemingly nowhere, and wrapped the sinners in unbreakable bonds. All three of them struggled wildly, their synthetic flesh hissing and burning under their fiendish binds. And then, Ichigo spoke. Transient. Beyond life and death. His voice, bereft of emotion, sent shivers down her spine. Merciless she thought. Which is the corner that my chain does not reach. The female screamed in horror, knowing what Ichigo's words delivered. The man, shook and fraught against their bonds, possessed and frantic with all-consuming dread. Which is the heart that my darkness does not devour. Her heart pounded painfully in her chest. She could taste sweat on her lips. The throbbing in her temples reinforced by centuries of instinct that screeched at her to flee for the sake of her sanity. Each word, it felt as if some terrible judgment was being passed, and Grafia knew that if those words were directed towards her, her mind would have shattered in sheer terror. Which is the world that my fire does not burn. The Chigo stood tall amidst a sea of fear and madness. His overwhelming presence crushing everyone else and Grafia couldn't help but compare his aura to the one her husband summoned to end the civil war that had plagued their kind for centuries. Unexpectedly, chains dragged forth the necromancer, its decrepit frame broken and limbless, as the infernal bindings pieced through its chest. Letting out low guttural growls, it spoke out in some deteriorated language she could not identify. Ichigo's head tilted, an innocent enough gesture that would have gone unheeded, had his eyes not been glinting in a shadow that transcended the evil of her ancestors. His arms spread wide, and a bone-white substance began to leak from the corner of his eyes and out of his mouth. Rejoice for I am your long-sought eternity. Grafia's world exploded in hellfire. Chapter 4. Familial Flames. A Searing of Flames. An Inferno of Pure Rage and Hate. Like a roar of a wrathful dragon, it consumed and devoured everything in its path. Leaving only misery and ash behind. It was darkness it was cruelty and he loved every bit of it. The rending of flesh. He tore at them. There was nothing graceful about it. Ripped them shred from shred. A savage brutality so unlike anything in the world that any mortal would have fallen into an unending madness from the mere sight. The screaming of souls. It's impossible to break or damage a soul. It is one of the few absolutes within the confines of creation. Yet, it can be burned. Gnawed on by the vicious worms that crawl through the abysmal fires and subjugated to horrors beyond the comprehension of any. And such was his relish. The Chigo woke with a start, his face covered by a thin veneer of grime and sweat. Immediately, his hands clawed at his face, dreading the ceramic monstrosity had taken over his appearance once more. His breathing was labored as his chest rose and fell in rapid motions. He took a quick glance around in an attempt to recognize his surroundings. A frown crossed his lips as he somehow winded up back in his room in the underworld. How did he come to be here when he was in Paris not but a few minutes ago? His brow furrowed as he fought to remember what the very last thing that had happened. He had gone down into the crypts with Grafia and she had. Agony and horror fused as one out of her mouth as he pressed the fire into her. Flesh burned away in fallen ash, and bone was left blackened and brittle, shown him how to detect magical wards and chided him for his overpowered approach. When he asked if he could simply tear them down she. Chains from the deepest corners of the pit shred through muscle and sinew. Organs, steaming and hot, spilled forth from jagged and bloody lacerations, chided him and told him the different layers and protections woven into the trap that he would eventually learn how to manipulate his own power on that level. She had then. Arc, ravenous he burned with such fury in search of the soul that there wasn't even any pain. His rage was so intense that the he burned the nerves away before pain could even be felt, given him that teasing smile that always seemed to set him at ease and reminded him of lost moments from, oh so, long ago. He followed as she led. He surged deep until he found churning sin that fed his flames even higher, and dark vengeance crept in twisted laughter and brutal joy, deeper into the catacombs and to the lair of the undead. Together, they had discovered the necromancer even as it brought forth the sinners he had been tasked with recapturing. The Chigo's brows furrowed as he struggled to drag up the rest of the memory. A small ants of pain pierced his temples, and the Chigo's expression fell from being confused to outright shock. 
Shades of cursed fire and sounds of eldritch madness consumed his thoughts. Dark. Compulsive. Intoxicating. It wasn't as if some other power had taken control of him. It wasn't that he had lost complete control of his facilities. It had all been him. He had been painfully aware of every action on his part. It was his duty, his purpose. To punish, to viciously take retribution against every single sin that he could dredge up from their tainted souls. Such was the function of hell, the abysmal pits that served as the daunting dread on the other side of death since time immemorial. You've woken up, a tired voice from his beside him asked. His neck snapped in the direction of the voice, and he saw Grafia raise her head from crossed arms on his bed. He blinked a few times. How long had she been there? It was then that a thought occurred to him and his eyes went wide. Swiftly his hands landed on her shoulders and he looked her over in concern. Are you alright? He fired off quickly. Damn it, I didn't hurt you did I? She smiled indulgently at him and calmly brushed his hands away. I am fine. It seems you were in total control the entire time. Your flames never touched me. Ichigo exhaled in reprieve and closed his eyes, as relief couldn't wash over him fast enough. For a horrid moment, he had honestly thought that she had been devoured in the surge of hellfire unleashed by his wrath. A shadow crept over his eyes and he dropped his face into a hand. A tired sigh escaped his lips and he threw himself backwards onto his bed in an undignified manner. An uncomfortable lapse of silence passed between them before Grafia said, would you like to talk about it? He lifted his hand and glanced over towards her. Ichigo would have snorted in amusement had he not been feeling such an incredible amount of stress. Still dressed in her street clothes, the strongest queen leaned forward in her seat, eyes shifting in worry. Never before had he seen the extraordinary woman look so utterly normal before. He turned his gaze up at the ceiling and blew out several strands of hair from his eyes. His throat constricted and an involuntary flinch passed through him as he remembered each violent onslaught he had committed. Warmth encompassed one of his hands and a gentle pressure applied itself. He craned his head and saw Grafia reaching over and gripping his hand in her own. The beautiful woman had distress and sorrow glistening in her shining silver eyes. And behind that sorrow, he found an unfathomable depth of strength and resolve. A small part of him, buried behind regrets and past miseries, reacted to that gaze. A serene ache long forgotten or maybe it had simply been hidden away. Regardless, under the careful search of those liquid metal eyes, Ichigo felt safer than he had in years. He didn't shy away from that powerful focus that seemed to radiate comfort and acceptance. I saw. He whispered and her eyes folded in confusion. Every. Single. Sin. And suddenly he knew that she understood as a wave of unease and mild horror flooded over him. Oh Ichigo her voice practically weeping in place of her eyes. He gritted his teeth. Every action, every wrongdoing. And they weren't petty things like thievery or lying. Murder abuse his throat constricted tightly. Rape. I just couldn't not do anything. His voice layered thinly with anger as he glared back up at the ceiling. I had to punish them. To make them feel pain to hear them scream. She didn't say anything, but she felt her grip on his hand tighten. He squeezed back as he shut his eyes tightly. He didn't regret his actions in the least bit and that terrified him. Ichigo Kurosaki had always fought for the singular purpose of protecting those dear to him. He wouldn't lie to himself and say that he did not enjoy the thrill of battle however, it always came down to keeping someone safe. Never before had he felt such an all-encompassing need to inflict harm. It was cruelty that had driven him. Beyond the senseless rage that pushed his inner hollow. Just pure, unadulterated malice. Moreover, the fact that he felt completely comfortable with his actions made a certain shame creep into his mind. He felt the bed shift beneath him. Grafia had moved to sit next to him. She transferred his hand to her other one and reached down with the other to brush away his locks from his brow. Her touch was a refreshing cool to the raging fire he knew that burned in his veins. Did you know, Ichigo-kun, that our ancestors, the very first of our race, were called demons instead of devils? He blinked in confusion at the abrupt trivia she brought up. Oh uh, no. I didn't. Grafia continued sifting her hands through his hair as she looked away and gained a far-off glimmer in her eyes. They were the ones who sided with Lucifer during his rebellion. Fallen from the heavenly host, dark spirits of the old world, and creatures born opposed to any form of light. When Lucifer affirmed his pact with hell, they all received a portion of its darkness. She let out a tired sigh. They reveled in that darkness. Moreover, they made it their personal goal to feed as many souls to the source of their terrible power. Hence, the rather ill reputation they had with the rest of the world. They were, in a word, evil. Her hands continued to brush through his hair and her eyes still lost in her ancient memories. Had the four not perished in the Great War, had Serzich's and his allies not been successful in their uprising, our people would have gone extinct. He opened his mouth to say something, but she cut him off. Do not misunderstand, Ichigo-kun, her eyes flashing towards him with rigid censure. I do not mean to tell you that this is your fate, merely warn you that the power you hold is one created for the purpose of causing suffering. 
That was not comforting at all, despite the tender touch of her fingers in his orange locks. You will have to guard your heart, make your resolve unwavering. This is your burden, Ichigo kun. Keep true to yourself and you will not fail as my ancestors failed. He digested her words. A rather bitter truth he realized. The thing that gave substance to his strength was the same force that brought forth the worst in what was already something evil. Ichigo raised his head slightly off his pillow and locked eyes with her. And can we keep this between us just for now? He asked hesitantly. She looked at him for a brief moment before nodding her head. I do believe this will be an isolated incident. As you gain more control over your, rather significant, power, you will find it easier to resist the urge to give in to Hell's power. If anything, it will become instinctual and easily managed. He dropped his head back down and sighed with assuagement. Rafia let out a quiet merriment, and her eyes held a soft laughter. As I said, this is your burden. However, you are not alone in this. We will support, as family should. A deep heat flooded through Ichigo's face when Grafia leaned over and planted onto his brow a soft kiss. Ichigo took a quick shower after his talk with Grafia and quickly swapped a change of clothes afterwards. Apparently, he had slept the night away after he gave into the darker aspects of his power. Securing his belt around his jeans, he closed the door to his room. Grafia had told him to go to Serzich's office as his unholy boss wanted to speak with him about some new assignment. Putting a hand to his neck as he worked out a minor crick, Ichigo began to circulate his power through his ankles. With a single step, he disappeared in a blur of muffled white noise. Traveling down the halls of the colossal manor, his lips twitched in amusement. He still hadn't fully gotten over how instinctive his use of Sunido had become. Arriving at in front of a rather ostentatious staircase, Ichigo stopped a maid that was coming down the steps. Yo, is Serzich's upstairs. The maid briefly looked surprised before dropping her head in a slight bow. Yes sir. The prince is within his working quarters. Ichigo resisted the urge to roll his eyes. Was it too much to ask for a little eye contact? Half the staff seemed terrified of offending him somehow. Granted, the sky-high pillars of flame visible for miles around that were a resultant of his training sessions probably had something to do with it. Thanks, he said before disappearing in another haze of static. Exactly three supernatural steps later, he arrived before two massive oaken doors. Various apocalyptic scenes adorned every inch of the ornate doors. All save for one space barely a hand's width and length. It the only place safe to knock on as, supposedly, anywhere else would result in a horrific curse that caused unimaginable pain for long periods of time. Personally, Ichigo felt that knocking anywhere else would be plain stupid, as the jutting pieces of carved wood would not be so accepting of his yielding flesh. He gave a sharp knock, and Serzich's responded cheerfully from the other side, enter. As he yanked on the iron ring and pulled the door forward, he noticed a strange carving of two guitars crossed. One had the number 61 and the other 49, written in a wicked-looking font. What a strange picture Ichigo thought. Ichigo slipped through the opening he made and closed the doors behind him. Inside, the proportionally large room to the doors, Ichigo saw Serzich's sitting at his desk all the way at the end of the office. While he expected to see Grafia there, he was quite surprised to see another person there as well. Slightly taller than Ichigo and possessing the same lean, muscular frame, his long brown hair was loosely tied in a knot, yet his bangs were let free to frame his handsome face. He wore a dark blue heori over black shirt and movable trousers. As always, Saoji had a calm and congenial smile on his face. Usually the man was off hunting down exceptionally dangerous strays for Serzich's. The ones that were too perilous for even the elite hunter teams under Falbia Masmadius's command. One last Sunido deposited him right between his fellow peerage members and before their king. It was a testament to Ichigo's proficiency with the technique that not a single paper on Serzich's desk moved in the wake of his abrupt arrival. Saoji offered him a polite greeting, which he returned in kind, while Grafia was cool as ever with a nod of acknowledgement. Ah, Ichigo-kun, Serzich's beamed up at him as he closed a manila folder and set it down. I'm glad to see that you're alright. I will admit to being rather worried when Grafia told me that you overextended yourself on your little trip. Do try and be more careful, won't you? Yeah, sorry about that, Ichigo said shifting his weight uncomfortably. No worries, the only sitting member of the quartet laughed off. Ichigo was infinitely grateful that Grafia had not told Serzich's what had actually happened. Not that he doubted that the severe woman would go back on her word. He was just exceedingly thankful that he could work out his own affairs without having to be coddled by his new employer. Though, he resisted the temptation to throw an appreciative look her way. Serzich's would notice it right away and undoubtedly question his wife in a more private environment. She might withhold information from him on Ichigo's behalf, but he doubted she would ever lie to the man. Even then, Serzich's was perceptive enough to put two and two together on his own. Despite acting like an idiot at times, the Crimson Lucifer was anything but. It hadn't taken long for Ichigo to notice that, behind his calm and humorous mannerisms, was a ruthless and calculating warrior. 
one that had overthrown a government in place for millennia by crushing his enemies underfoot and driving the rest into exile. Said ruthless warrior's voice brought him out of his thoughts. I have a couple of assignments for both you and Sauji, he said while holding up two documents. Well, the second is actually only for you, Ichigo, however, Sauji asked to tag along, so I've allowed him. Alright, Ichigo nodded. So what are we doing? The first one is rather simple, if not tedious. Serzicha said with a drab smile. The two of you are going to be settling a dispute between two lords over a strip of land. Ichigo scowled slightly. That sounds more of a job for lawyers than for us. I am afraid I must concur with my young Kohai, Serzicha's sama. Sauji frowned. Swords will be of little use in an argument of greed. Serzicha's chuckled lightly. You won't actually be settling the argument, in truth. I have my more air subtle subordinates handling that part. I just need you two to keep the two lords in line. Sounds a bit overkill if you ask me, Ichigo dryly intoned, causing Serzicha's to sigh. Normally I'd agree, but both have set up small contingents of soldiers on opposite sides of the land. I'd rather not have to deal with a minor civil war in my nation, thank you very much. Grafia, if you will. Their queen waved a hand, and a holographic map appeared over Serzich's desk. She drew a crude circle of glowing blue light with her finger on a section of the summon diagram. This is the area disputed between Lords Bareth and Furfur. Here she stopped and gave Ichigo a hard stare. He held that stare for a moment before sighing in defeat. Sauji chuckled heartedly and clasped him on the back. Serzich's gave his own mischievous smile, and Ichigo's scowl deepened in response to the two men. Finally he said, Bareth is a greater duke of the pillars, and the entire line is famous for its talent in alchemy. Particularly in transmutation. Furfur is an earl of the 72. They hold incredible talent in weather manipulation, mainly in lightning and wind magic. So much so that, it was said at one point, only Thor and Zeus surpassed them in their ability to conjure a storm. Both families, strangely enough, are filled with pathological liars. Um, Grafia nodded approvingly before returning her attention to the map. Duke Bareth has soldiers stationed here, here and here. She said pointing and highlighting places on the map. And these are where Earl Furfur's men are stationed. Forgive me, Grafia don't know, Sauji said cupping his chin as he examined the troop placements. But I cannot help but wonder why both lords would spend such heavy resources on such a meager plot of land. Is there some hidden secret to this, otherwise, unexceptional place? Yes there is, Serzich's answered in place of his wife. Recent land surveys show that there may be deposits of Orich Alchem there. Understanding lit Sauji's eyes even as Ichigo's filled with confusion. Ah, the Shinsengumi captain nodded. I can see now why both families are pressing such a trivial issue so strongly. Orich Alchem? Ichigo asked with a puzzled look. He turned towards Grafia as she began to explain. Orich Alchem is a very precious metal that naturally develops in certain magically rich conditions. Not only is it a remarkably hard material, it is also an excellent conductor of magic. Everything from weapons, armor to even building materials can be manufactured from it. Oh, Ichigo said in understanding. Kind of like Mithril in all those video games, huh? At this, the two men let out a quiet laughter, and even Grafia cracked a smile. Serzich's gave his pawn a crooked smile. Ichigo-kun, if it was Mithril, I'd go join that little war of theirs personally. Ichigo blinked. Mithril is real too. Serzich's nodded his head in amusement. It's easily the most valuable metal in the known world. I believe Tolkien put it best. Light as a feather and hard as a dragon scales, super rare too, I bet. Ichigo asked with noted interest. In this day and age. Serzich has raised an eyebrow. It's practically impossible to get. I am reminded of the old Atlantian tale, Sauji smiled fondly. Atlantian tale? Ichigo quirked an eyebrow. Serzich has nodded his head as he indulged Ichigo's curiosity. There's this ancient tale of how Ajniha, last king of Atlantis, challenged the dragon of domination. He supposedly wore a complete suit of mithril armor, and when the dragon breathed fire upon him, the armor was left unmarred. Sauji let out a small laugh and finished Serzich's relation, on the other hand, the dragon's fire was so intense that Ajniha ended up being cooked from the inside out. The dragon of domination? Ichigo asked, his eyes drawn in perplexity. Aye, the Welsh Emperor himself, a booming voice called from behind them. The three servants turned around while Serzich sat straighter in his chair. The giant of a man, encompassed by wild flaming orange hair, tramped towards them with massive strides. His entire frame was composed of rippling and thickly roped muscles. A light spray tan covered what was once frost-white skin. A rugged look and eyes that danced with fire, Surtur Second was the kind of person that little girls ran screaming from. The lay Drake and Albion were going at it like they always used Ta. Thoughtful off a king though Tommy am in battle. Ha. Only a complete idiot would challenge those two monsters a once. The giant steps were heavy and thudded on the stone floor. He inclined his head towards Grafia before dropping a massive hand on Ichigo's shoulders, nearly causing the young man to fall to his knees. 
Good to see you again laddie. Second laughed loudly. Hey, Ichigo offered with a wince. You're back early, Serzichas said with a small smile playing on his lips. I, second grunted. Them cowards ran quickly enough. So I came back home to grab a bio grub. Imagine me surprised thought four of us be gathered here. Tis a rarity. Obviously you need more work then, Grafia called with narrowed eyes. Ooh oh now, the burly man smiled. Dinny be like thought sis. Need plenty o' oh, relaxation I do. Twas not easy trekking through the mills. Well, regardless, I haven't finished getting Sauji and Ichigo up to task on their upcoming mission, and afterwards you need to give me your full report. Serzichas smiled. Hold on, Ichigo protested with a grimace. Who the hell are Albion and Dreg? You didn't know? Second frowned, right before he turned towards Grafia. He be slackin' with the lads learnin' their sis. The other three men went wide-eyed as Grafia silently began to fume at the insult. Second, not paying attention to the situation at all, tactlessly continued on. Let this humble Jodin fix the Olays in Yarid. Albion the Banishing Emperor and Drag the Welsh Emperor. Dragons the both of them. Nasty rivals, the two of them too and quite powerful. Use Ta to the world up in their fightin'. It was them that sank Atlantis after Tha King took sword and spear Ta um. Second began to gesture wildly with his muscle-roped arms. A sight Ta behold laddie. The seas roared tar the skies and waves crashed like thunder upon the shores. Dragon fire rained down in the entire citadel spli and twain. Twas the stuff of nightmare and legends. Second, Grafia got out through gritted teeth. Perhaps your tale can come at another time. We are preoccupied at the moment. Nonsense. Second barked. Lads in need of proper guidance. Can Elem get by like this? He be a disgraced tar group with a slacken. Besides Oof. Ichigo wisely followed Sauji and Serzich's example and backed up several paces as Grafia seemingly had enough and slammed the back of her hand into the giant solar plexus. The foolish clone giant had doubled over in pain and wheezed out as his diaphragm struggled paralyzed. Grafia brought her arm up and sent her elbow smashing to the back of Surtur Second's head. The massive chamber shook as the impact caused a small shockwave to travel through the entire mansion. The Norse giant slid to the floor unconscious, and as Grafia snapped her gaze up, Serzichas ducked behind his desk, and Ichigo and Sauji pressed themselves against the wall. Serzichas Sama, Grafia said as the wrinkles of frustration smoothed over and her delicate features fell neutral once more. Why yes. He said timidly as he slowly rose from behind his desk. Perhaps it is time to finish this so that Sauji san and Ichigo kun can be about their business. She said evenly. Ichigo heard Serzichas swallow hard. All right. Get that affair with Bareth and Furfur finished then head over to Kyoto in the human world. All the details are in this folder. Serzich smiled weakly as he threw the folder at Sauji. Dismissed. I am glad you taught me this technique Ichigo-kun. Sauji said as he viewed the city below. It is most useful and much less inconspicuous than our wings. No problem, Sauji-san. Ichigo said lightly from beside the man. Both men hovered a few hundred meters above the ancient city of Kyoto. It had taken most of the morning and a good chunk of the afternoon to clear up the messy conflict between the Bareth and Furfur clans. In fact, by the two of them arrived, open hostilities had begun to take place, and a small-scale war was underway. It was only when Ichigo and Sauji unleashed their combined demonic power and crushed everyone in the vicinity to the ground that they stopped fighting. Even then, they both had to consistently keep up a certain level of pressure to dissuade any further fighting. Of course, once the small militias had been dealt with, Serzich's less combat-oriented servants brought the two lords together and began hammering out a compromise. It wasn't easy. Tempers had flared, threats had been made, swords been drawn. The two pillars only managed to act reasonably when Ichigo threatened to turn the entire expanse of land into a smoldering crater. Although, afterwards both lords had made some derogatory comments about his and Sauji's reincarnated status. Luckily Ichigo was used to such things from his days in high school, and Sauji had long since been accustomed to the bigotry of to some of the pure-blooded devils. Unfortunately for said bigots, both Ichigo and Sauji were far more powerful than they were, and, in the underworld society, that's all that mattered. Once Serzich's legal department had finished up and an accord had been reached, Ichigo and Sauji grabbed a small lunch and shipped off for Kyoto. Sauji had been particularly eager to revisit the jurisdiction of the old military police. It has been quite some time since I last visited the old imperial capital. Sauji said wistfully. Ichigo tilted his head towards the senior servant and asked, you left before the capital was transferred to Tokyo, right? Indeed, the old warrior nodded his head. I was in Edo though it had yet to be named the capital yet. I was dying of tuberculosis when Serzich's Sama had offered me a place in his peerage. I had no desire to meet my end in a sickbed rather than at the tip of a blade. It would have been shameful, so I shook hands with the devil in hopes that my demise would arrive in some more glorious fashion. I can happily say that I have never regretted that decision. It still amazes that I get to talk to one of the Bashan War's most famous figures. 
They talk about you in our schools. Ichigo said with a slight smile. Saoji smiled gracefully. You flatter me Ichigo-kun. I played but a humble part in that war. Do you see that sight? He said with near excitement and Ichigo followed Saoji's finger as he pointed towards a particular place down below. It is greatly changed yet I still recognize it. It was there that I first locked swords with Himura Dot. Himura? Ichigo queried. Their books will say naught of him, Saoji said with fire in his eyes and sharp smile on his face. He was an imperial assassin and, perhaps, the greatest swordsman of the war. Better than you? Ichigo asked teasingly. Saoji took it in stride. At the time? Yes. Manslayer we called him and truly, many met their doom by his blade. I believe his head count had surpassed a hundred by the end of the revolution. Ichigo looked on in surprise, having not expected the admission. You would have marveled at the strength reflected in his sword. Saoji shook his head ruefully. At that point in my life, I had already had some exposure to the supernatural. Yet, in spite of my advantage, like a demon in battle he was and every stroke of steel was death heralded. The draw of his sword made Rajin's bolt pale in swiftness. Sounds like quite the warrior, Ichigo mulled. Saoji hummed in agreement. I believe this is enough of nostalgia for now. Let's us descend and proceed on foot. It would not bode well for us to be tardy for our appointment with Yusaka Haim. You've met her? Ichigo stuffed his hands in his pockets as he slid down through the air. I have never met her personally, Saoji admitted with a shrug. Although, I've seen her from a distance and have heard much of her from the Imkai of Kyoto. Oh? She is said to very fair with those she reigns over and quite humble. Yet, there is said to be a severity in her that she shares with the Lady of the Sun and Universe. So kinda like Grafi and E, Ichigo asked with a wry smile. Oh not at all, Saoji chuckled. She smiles far more often than our beloved queen. They both touched the ground simultaneously and began to navigate through the various pilgrims and tourists that flooded the central city. Quickly, the two of them made their way to back alleys where the less savory characters tended to reside. Taking care to avoid the puddles in the gravel road, Ichigo's lips turned downward as a certain music hit his ears. I do believe that is yours, Ichigo-kun, Saoji pointed out. Reaching into his pocket, Ichigo pulled out his cell phone. Surprise flitted across his face as the caller ID displayed a name he had not expected to call him. Pressing the green talk button, Ichigo held his phone to his ear. Yuzu. Ani-chan. Ah. Ichigo swiftly pulled the device away from his ear as the volume of his sister's voice threatened to damage his ears. Why are you yelling? He said as he switched the phone to the other ear and cleaned out the initial one with his pinky finger. It's been a month since you've called. He could practically hear the angry pout in her tone. You don't call, you don't text and you haven't responded to anything we've sent you. Where have you been? Ah, I've been Ichigo cut himself off as he yawned. He was still somewhat tired from the previous night and his excursions in the underworld earlier this morning. Sorry, I've been preoccupied with stuff. Stuff. What stuff? The suspicion was less dripping and more outright pouring. You're not fooling around with some girl are you? That broke him out of his stupor. What? Where did you get that kind of crazy idea? I'm simply busy with my new job. There was a small silence on the other end of the line that made him check to phone see if it was still connected. Hoi, Yuzu. Huh? So it was a job. He heard her mutter from the other side. What kind of job? The mistrust back in full force. Yuzu, annoyance barely keeping out of his voice. Don't make me come over there and spank you. Meanie, Ani-chan, he heard her blow a raspberry and he fought to not roll his eyes in face of her childishness. Where are you, anyways? Huh? I'm in Kyoto with a friend. What? She shrieked. Why are you all the way over there? Apparently, his conversation with Yuzu was quite audible to those around him because Saoji was sniggering into his hand. One of my professors is out in a conference so class was cancelled for today. So we thought to ourselves, why not? Let's go on a trip. And here we are. That sounds awfully convenient, she mused, much to Ichigo's exasperation. He then noticed Saoji motion to him that they had arrived. Yuzu? Yes. I'm hanging up now. Why click? He shook his head in a silent sigh as he deposited his phone into the confines of his jeans. He knew that she'd give him hell the next time they ended up speaking, but he reasoned that if he sent her a few photos of the area she'd calm down. Gesturing to the wall at the end of an alley filled with trash cans, Saoji said, and here we are. The stone wall faded away to reveal a completely different world. Creatures of all shapes and sizes drifted to and fro along the newly revealed alley. They clambered over each other in some instances, and some were even traversing the walls of the various buildings. As Ichigo took a closer look, he noticed that it appeared that he and Saoji had traveled back in time. Judging by the wistful expression on his companion's face, this was very similar to how he grew up. Well, similar if you subtracted the dancing kappa, the oni attempting to sell Tayaki and Kuchisakana, gesturing towards them rather suggestively. Ichigo turned his attention from the illicit imkai to Saoji when he felt the man's power fluctuate slightly. Everything alright. 
he asked with an upturned brow. Perfectly fine, Saoji inclined his head. Simply my inner new acting up in the presence of his kin. Inner new? Ichigo asked, bemused. I bet there's a story behind that. Saoji smiled mysteriously. Perhaps another time. The two devils walked down the alley infested with various other supernatural entities, though they were given a wide berth. Despite them reigning in their monstrous presence, the Imkai could still sense the dense demonic power that lay within the pair. As Ichigo inhaled, he could taste the power that within the very air. Kyoto's underground was very different from the underworld. He had asked a few questions of Grafia before departing, and she had informed him that Kyoto lay on an unusually potent lee line. An intersection between mystical energies from within the planet itself. Due to the underworld being an extension of hell, it possessed no such phenomena. However, that isn't to say that the underworld did not have its fair share of anonymities and ghastly secrets. Grafia had also informed him how Yasaka, the Kikbi and ruler of Japan's Imkai, was the one who regulated the Lee Line. That without her, it would run rampart and cause various singularities, which would, in all likelihood, expose the supernatural world to the unsuspecting mortal realm. As such, her existence was paramount to the preservation of stability in the world. The Silver Queen had, for this reason, expressly told Ichigo, read. Threatened to be as courteous as possible with her and beyond his best behavior. The devils had a somewhat tentative agreement with the Imkai of Japan. So long as the devils would not blatantly abuse the Japanese population and interfere with their system, the Imkai would allow them to run minute operations and allow them to set up small-scale territories. Therefore, Ichigo's meeting with Yasaka could potentially be a breakthrough in the rather isolationist government of Japan's supernatural realm on behalf of the underworld. Which, of course, begged the question, why, in the name of all that was unholy, was he the one dealing with this? Shouldn't someone of more seniority and experience handle something as this massively consequential? Moreover, on that note, why wasn't Sir Afo Leviathan, the one in charge of foreign affairs, spearheading this, rather, substantial responsibility? Of course, when he had voiced all this Grafia, she simply coolly dismissed all his questions and promptly sent him off to the human world. It didn't take much of a genius for him to realize that there was something going on behind his back. Something that he really didn't want any part of. So consumed in his thoughts was Ichigo that he didn't notice knocking a small diminutive figure over. It wasn't until the small figure let out a yelp that he realized what had happened. Ow! A young, girlish voice cried out. Watch where you're going. Ichigo looked down in slight surprise. A young girl with bright golden hair and cat-like ears of the same color sat massaging her forehead. She was dressed in a shine maiden's outfit and, if Ichigo hurt to hazard a guess, she appeared to be around 9 or 10 years old. The same age as Milika's he silently mused. Ah, Ichigo held out a hand toward the young girl with a polite smile. I'm sorry, I wasn't paying attention to where I was going. She ignored his hand and stood on her own as she dusted herself off. Your apology is accepted. She then scrutinized them with a look of distrust. Who are you? You do not appear to be Imkai. Our apologies for any discomfort we caused you, Oju Sama, Saoji went down on one knee to be eye level with the young girl. I am Akita Saoji, and this is my friend Ichigo Kurosaki. We are devils. The devils, the golden haired girl suddenly didn't look so sure of herself. However, she quickly cleared her throat and struck a pose with her hands on hips. I am Kunu of the Kikbi clan. By what right do you trespass on our lands? Ichigo exchanged an amused glance with Saoji. He would let the samurai handle the situation for now. Ah, Saoji gave a brilliant smile that sent most females' hearts aflutter. Once again, I apologize if we offered any grievance, Oju-sama. However, we are here to honor the audience granted to us by Yasaka Haim. Obviously, the girl had not been expecting that answer, based on the days that passed over eyes. Akasama. She muttered to herself, though not so quietly that the two devils couldn't hear her. They exchanged another glance, though this one far more serious. Oju-sama, Saoji began. Are you perhaps Yasaka Haim's daughter? Yue. She let out a gasp of bewilderment. How did you find out? Ichigo and Saoji frowned synchronously. Saoji replied in a tone that was faintly admonishing. Where are your guards? Surely you are not wandering unattended by yourself. Ichigo added his own two cents. It's not safe for you to be out on your own. The sun will set within a few short hours. Err, Kunu's ears deflated as a slight tinge of pink flushed her cheeks. She mumbled something to the side and broke eye contact with them. Once more, Ichigo locked eyes with Saoji, and they both nodded in agreement as the same thought passed through their heads. Ichigo turned his head back towards Kunu as Saoji moved to get up. He offered a kind smile and said, would you allow us to escort you back to your home? Seeing as how we're also heading there. Ichigo had to stifle a snort as he saw the little girl glare at the two suspiciously from the corners of her eyes before she gave a single imperious nod. Very well. We will allow you the honor of accompanying us home. But the quirk of his lips Ichigo said, shall we be off then? She raised her nose haughtily. Very well. 
Saoji and Ichigo rumbled in silent amusement as they set off towards the large castle that stood as the capital of Japan's supernatural world. It was quite the sight, Ichigo had to admit to himself. Especially with how it loomed over the rest of the city with the sun at its back. Ichigo and Saoji swerved through the heavy pedestrian traffic as it increased substantially in the twilight hours. Kunu, on the other, was not so lucky. Her short legs were not capable of keeping up with the tall and lanky underworld denizens and, on more than one occasion, was she nearly knocked over. Seeing this, Ichigo reached out and picked the young Kikbi up into his arms. She sputtered wildly in shock and protest. WWW what are why you doing her face turning a bright shade of scarlet as her face was brought uncomfortably close to Ichigo's. He looked at her with dryly and deadpanned, I doubt your mother would appreciate it if we brought you back trampled and covered in footprints. Bibi Baka. Put me down this instant. Her arm slapping against his chest. Now, now Kunu Haim, Saji beamed pleasantly. It's much safer for you this way. And it's faster too. Why you uncivilized brute? P put me down. Ichigo looked her dead in the eyes, his deep brown ur eyes is searing into her golden ones. The girl slowly turned an impossible shade of red. Kai. She buried her face into Ichigo's face to hide her embarrassment. A few minutes later, they arrived at the gate of the massive castle, guarded by two large and intimidating ogre-like creatures. They were rather unpleasant to look at with their bulging muscles of pink flesh that was laid bare. Their only clothing, thankfully, was a striped loincloth. As they approached, one of them spoke in a guttural tone, its voice like a nasty case of serious congestion. Halt. None may enter at this time. Turn back. Ichigo was about to argue that they had an appointment, but a sudden voice called from above. Kunu Haim. Both he and Saoji looked skywards to see a man with large black wings descend upon them. The fallen. Ichigo's eyes narrowed dangerously. However, he noticed that Saoji was as relaxed as ever. Well, as relaxed as a man forged through countless battles could get. As the figure came closer and the lantern light of the settling night illuminated its face, Ichigo realized it wasn't a fallen. The dead giveaway was the bird-like face. Kurakumo. Kunu exclaimed from Ichigo's grasp. He turned towards what he realized must be a Tengu and gestured towards Kunu with his chin, I'm going to assume that this belongs to you. I must thank you for returning Kunu Haim to us. Though I must ask, who are you? Ichigo didn't miss how the Tengu placed a hand on the pommel of a sword strapped to his hip. We are here on behalf of our master, Serzich's Lucifer. Yusaka Haim requested our presence. Saoji diplomatically replied from besides him. Wait a minute we were requested to come here. Ichigo's kept his face impassive, but inside turmoil began to build. No Serzich said that only I was required for this, and Saoji simply decided to tag along just what the hell is going on. Returning his attention to conversation at hand, Ichigo saw the Tengu look at them carefully. The underworld emissaries. He softly intoned with surprise. Um, Kurakumo hummed. Very well, I will have someone guide you to the audience chamber, if you will wait but a moment. Kunu Haim, come, let us return to your quarters. Surprisingly, the golden-haired child wrapped her arms around Ichigo's neck tightly. We are most see comfortable with our current steed. W we will remain with him. She refused to meet any of their gazes. Kurakumo looked at the pair of devils uncomfortably, no doubt fearing how they would react to being treated as mere mounts. Luckily, Saoji diffused the tension with a hearty laugh. From pawn to horse. Your good fortune unfailingly continues, Ichigo-kun. Don't I know it, Ichigo muttered sardonically. Shall we get going? Or are we going to stand out here all night? The Tengu coughed into his hand. Air, yes, I will take you to see her highness. As Kurakumo turned, neither Ichigo nor Saoji missed how his fingers twitched and how several shadows seemed to jump forward and into the castle. They silently fell into one stride and Ichigo shifted Kunu in his arms so that he could reach Zanjetsu more effectively. Though he doubted that there would be any attacks on his person so long as Kunu was so close. Still, there was no harm in caution. They treaded through the ancient castle with Kurakumo as their guide. Every so often, Kunu would make some comment about a particular place they passed or a work of art that hanged from the walls. Ascending a massive staircase, which Ichigo thought was far too large to serve any reasonable purpose, they arrived at an equally immense door. It was painted bright red and held patterns of inlaid golden flowers. Two other Tengu stood guard at the door, each wielding what appeared to be a monk's shakaj. Oh dear, Kurakumo turned towards them in an apologetic tone. How rude of me. I completely forgot to ask for names. Kurosaki Ichigo, he offered. Akita Saoji, Saoji smiled. Kurakumo's eyes went wide. The former captain of the Shinsengumi's first troop and the human who defeated the traitor Shinigami Aizen. Surely the Crimson Lucifer has taken fearsome servants. Ichigo was mildly amazed that his actions and the events of the Winter War were known to supernatural world. Then again, Serzich's was fully aware of who he was and what had happened, so it wasn't too much of a stretch that the world at large was privy to the Aizen's rebellion. 
In fact, he'd be thoroughly disappointed if the Japanese supernatural world was ignorant of what was happening in their own front yard. The red doors opened with fluid ease, and Ichigo beheld a chamber with a vaunted ceiling held aloft by colossal pillars of white timber. Crimson silks embroidered with gold foil hung loftily and billowed out. The floor was of marble bricks, and on the edges of the gargantuan chamber were pools of crystal water that splashed with elegant koi fish. A smell of fresh jasmine clung in the air and along the walls grew branches of twisted and knotted wood that shone with silver leaves and golden flowers. However, despite all the beauty that was laid before him, Ichigo had only eyes for the single occupant of the room. Seated on a wide throne of vibrant scarlet and glaring white, nine tails of the purest gold fur lightly flailed about. Hair of liquid gilt cascaded down a straight and poised back. Eyes shining like the sun, features that seemed angelic and ethereal, and a smile that was both gracious yet mischievous. We greet you, envoys of Kunu. The nine-tailed magnificence breathed out. And just like that, the august grandeur of the moment was utterly shattered into irreparable pieces. The little girl struggled out of his arms with an exited yell, Akasama. The pitter-patter of Kunu's feet on the stone floor lulled everyone into a silent stupor. With a giggle, the smallest of them threw herself into the arms of her mother. Kunu, Yasaka looked entirely flabbergasted at the appearance of her daughter. Just what are you doing here? That would be my blunder, Yasaka Haim, Kurakumo bowed. I will suffer through any punishment that you devise as repayment. Isaka looked back and forth between her guests and her daughter. Her mouth opened and fell before she finally absently said, you may approach. Ichigo and Saoji followed the Tengu and stopped several paces from the throne and its bear. What is the meaning of this? Yusaka asked, the hint of frown on her face. I was idle in my watching of Kunuheim, and she managed to elude me. Kurakumo said getting down on one knee. Fortuitously, our honored guests returned with her. Isaka turned a glare towards her daughter, Ichigo and Saoji entirely forgotten, and said, you ran away again, didn't you? Akasama, the girl pouted. It's so boring listening to Kurakumo talk and talk. I wanted a break. Ichigo and Saoji stole a glance at each other and then back to the mother-daughter duo. Something to tell when they went back home. Isaka pinched Kunu's cheeks. It what's? It what's? The little vixen moaned in her mother's lap. Kurakumo, take Kunu back to my quarters and keep her there. I will deal with her once I have attended to our guests. Yusaka commanded and disappointment immediately shadowed Kunu's face. But Akasama, she whined. Oh, she said with finality in her tone. Hein, Kunu huffed. As she hopped down and passed them, Kunu halted and bowed respectfully to the two. We are most appreciative for your assistance. Ichigo would have scoffed at the rapid transition from childish baby to perfect princess if it weren't for the somewhat formal atmosphere that remained. Saoji, on the other hand, went along with it perfectly. It was our pleasure, Kunu Haim. Kurakumo led the small Kikbi away, and the adults turned their attention on one another. I must apologize if Kunu gave you any trouble. It's difficult for a child that age to be cooped up indoors all day. Ichigo smiled in remembrance of fond memories as he said, I have two younger sisters so I can sympathize. Isaka returned his smile and turned towards Saoji. I was not expecting another son of this land, I am glad to finally meet you, Akita Saoji. Your dealings with my kin are well known. Saoji's eyes widened slightly before he bowed at the waist. I am deeply humbled to be honored with your presence, Yusaka Haim. Please, Yusaka shook her head, her glimmering locks of gold swaying in the motion. There is no need of that. Then she sighed. Kunu most wonderfully shattered any and all pretense of spectacle and command I had so diligently set up. And Kurosaki Ichigo, deeper eyes as of roiling gold studied him. There was age and wisdom behind those eyes. The human who fought so valiantly. The one who ascended beyond the realms of mortality. Long have the forces of Kyoto kept our eyes on you. You have? Ichigo asked, his shoulders tensing. At this point, he wanted answers. Why? She gave him a sad smile. That is not for me to answer. His eyes narrowed. Then who? His voice an edged whisper. Isaka straightened in her throne and, much to the two men's astonishment, she began to glow a bright shine. He threw his arms up as a rush of power assaulted him and he felt his skin begin blister under the surge of energy and heat. He sensed Saoji veil himself in a dense layer of demonic power, even as he called on the depths of his own inner darkness. Ichigo could feel something coming, something that was powerful and incredibly old. Something which was causing his devil instincts to scream at him. The rush of blood throbbed through his veins and a constant pounding in his temples ached against his brain. And the strangest thing was Zanjetsu. The blade was practically shaking in anticipation and oozing a sense of rightness. Rays of golden power erupted and heaved through the massive chamber. He increased his outpour of demonic taint and grounded himself from being pushed back. In a final burst, the intense power disappeared, leaving Saoji and Ichigo cloaked in malevolence. That regal, ancient and all too feminine voice called. Would be our charge. Ichigo looked up, his eyes widened in astonishment, and his mouth fell open in utter shock. 
Isaka had been beauty embodied but this woman was beyond anything that Ichigo could comprehend. No, beautiful would be an insult, completely insufficient as a description. Divine Ichigo wondered in awe. Ebony strands of pure silk held by golden pins hung at waist length. It framed her head and was elegantly cut across her shining brow. It had a luster that seemed to draw in the light around it, all too akin to a raven's feathers. The shape of her eyes was perfectly oriental, yet still, they seemed to be hawk-like and sharp. Thick and long lashes that shadowed her eyes, delicately fluttered in a strong appraisal. And her gaze, her eyes were of molten gold that shone with the understanding of the millennia. Soft lips, small and thin, pressed into a thin line, embodied what the word lovely wished to define. Her nose was a delicate shaping, surpassing any marble work made by the greatest of sculptors. There was no possible way this woman, this exquisiteness was in any way of this world. She looked ethereal, fleeting, as if the world itself could not comprehend her existence. There was a sharp movement to the right of him, and Ichigo craned his neck, making sure to keep the unearthly woman in his sight at all times. Tsaoji had fallen to his knees, his head bowed as low as possible. Ichigo's eyes flickered back to the woman even as hers had moved to Sauji. Leave us Sauji, her voice was like waves of light. Evanescent and flowing impossibly. Sauji, in response, was as serious as he ever heard the man. As you command a matter Asusama. Ichigo stopped breathing. What? He didn't notice Sauji respectfully backtrack out of the room. He didn't hear the doors shut behind him. All that was going through his mind was an attempt to process what he had just heard Sauji utter. Does that young upstart desire to irritate us by parading another of his stolen trophies? Her words snapping him out of his thoughts. As his eyes once more drank in her encompassing radiance and magnificence, he found himself feeling something too familiar. Similar to the feeling Grafia elicited earlier this morning. The dull ache spread through his chest. A single delicate eyebrow arched. Have you no honored words of greeting to offer us, Kurosaki Ichigo? I Ichigo found himself unable to speak. Such eloquence, she drawled. Surely, Masaki, you would grieve for your son if you beheld him now. Ichigo's eyes broke wide. What? He breathed in disbelief. Do you knew my mother? He asked, nearly shaking in incredulity. Of course, words fell like nectar and chime upon his ears. The land beneath us, it is our garden. Our nursery. She raised a hand cut like diamond, and mystifying light arose in a fine mist. A myriad of faces and people reflected through dancing facets. Nihinjin, they are all our children. For we watch, we guide and we bless. Your mother was no different for she was born of our people. Our claim was greater upon her than even the slumbering king. She flicked her wrist, and the faces drifted away into glittering dust. Yet she was robbed from us, even as you were robbed as well. A sudden undercurrent of anger in her resonant voice. She rose from her throne, and Ichigo couldn't help but notice the grandeur of her bearings. A robe of deep purple majesty and onyx silk. It shifted shades and hues. And draped over her shoulders was magnificent fur of the purest white. She descended the stairs and came to a stop in front of him. A single hand rose, and the world around them shimmered. Gone was the throne room of Kyoto's imperial castle. Instead, Ichigo stared in awe as they stood upon a mountaintop, high in the air and swathed in wisps of broken clouds. The mountain itself was covered in small grass, and, Ichigo turned around as Amaterasu moved past him. A large flowering plum tree of effervescent pink stood tall and proud. Its heavy roots growing into and around the mountaintop. She was a unique child, Masaki was, Amaterasu said in a quiet tone. Despite her rearing, she still bowed to us. A single stone bench sat underneath the solitary tree, and Amaterasu took to it with all grace and poise befitting her station. Twenty years now, come and gone, when she and your father made a trip to ice. To our shrine. Unknown to either yet known to us, a life being formed, a soul setting in place. The implications of her words rang strong in Ichigo's mind, and he couldn't help but wonder why a drop of sorrow had entered those shifting gold eyes we beheld you. At once, we recognized the weaves of fate and destiny that enshrouded you. We set watch, knowing the greatness you would bring in your wake. The barest hints of sorrow crept onto her immaculate features. As our son, we gave you our blessing. By no quirk of fate is your soul named Zanjetsu. In our honor, in tribute to our favor, the white blade thrummed in answer. The gesture of her hand, she motioned him to sit beside her, and a sudden lump caught in his throat at the naked emotion he witnessed in her eyes. His feet were heavy leaden as he inched forward towards her. Gingerly, he sat down and she took him into her side in full. Such strength, such courage and such love you displayed. Upon your demise, we would have raised you a guardian of hope. A spirit of protection for those who needed it. Yet you were snatched from us. You've got to be kidding me why why is she crying? Golden orbs moistened as she raised a hand to his jaw. We saw you, we watched you mature, and we came to love you as we do all our children. A light laugh echoed across the skies, and Ichigo felt his chest constrict in an unbearable discomfort. Though, perhaps, we agree to favor you more than others. 
the lone hand, impossible in its splendor, rose to brush away strands of orange hair from brown eyes, and Ichigo saw flashes of his mother within his mind. And now, finally you are with us. Drowned in fire and ash, a darkness we cannot deliver you from. The taint, he practically choked out. My soul was long gone. She shook her head, ebony cascading like a river of onyx gems over one another. We could have saved you, kept the shadow at bay, as long as our light was permitted to shine. Yet, in the end, the air of the fallen star took you from us. Her eyes darted over every one of his features, and Ichigo lost himself in the shadow of the sun. In its sorrow and bitter joy. He felt her hand on the back of his neck, a gentle pressure pulling him down. Had anyone told before this would happen, he would have laughed in their face. Honestly, having Amaterasu herself letting him rest his head in her lap. Frankly, at this point, Ichigo was drawing a blank. All he knew was that her fingers in his hair was the single most soothing thing he had ever felt. He could feel his eyes droop as any and all weariness melted away. There wasn't a battle to be fought. No war to be waged. And certainly no enemy to be defeated. All Ichigo felt was the simple yet profound feeling of contentment. You are stolen from us and though we may no more lay our blessings upon you, know that a mother will always love her son. Her fingers brushed his bangs back, letting the warmth of her touch elicit a current of heat through his head and down his body. He was lulled deeper and deeper into a dream. Though we would ask of you a favor. Um, he hummed, barely coherent in his thoughts as lightness overtook him. Isaka is an aspect of our glory. As our worthiest son, we have deemed you proper for her. Will you agree to this? Was there a sudden different emotion behind her tone? One all too wolfish. He, uh, he sighed as sleep overcame him. Notes of purity and mirth rang through him as his body and mind fell into oblivion. You may be gone from our reach, she murmured softly into his hair. Yet for this night, you are our child once again. Several hours later, Yusaka would have a small mental breakdown when she woke with a smiling devil, snoozing softly in her bed. Let me know in the comments below if you guys want the next part. Also check out my other video that has been shown and left. Thank you for watching, if you enjoyed this video please like and share this video. And have a fantastic day bye.